Welcome to Google Sheets. What I want to tell you is that data loves spreadsheets and that really you could learn to love them too. Now, you may not think of yourself as a data kind of person, but the important thing to know about data is no matter what you do, data gives you a map. It helps you find your way. And you may wonder, a map to what? Well, that depends on what your goals are. They might be professional, organizational, social, personal, political. But whatever it is you're interested in, data can help you do it better. For instance, if you have a business, it can help you figure out what work that you do is most popular with paying clients. It can help you figure out what brings people back to your nonprofit organization. It can help you say what attracts new people to your political organization. It may help you figure out what's the best use of time in your own personal life. And it can even help you figure out important questions like how much should you charge for your work or your services. So data is a method of approaching any one of these questions. But what does that have to do with Google Sheets? Well, Google Sheets lets you do several different things that are really important with data. First and foremost, Google Sheets gives your data a home. You, now you know where your stuff is and you can find it, you can search for it, you can share it with other people. You get it centralized and now you can do something useful with it. And, you know, then what, what are those things that you're going to do? Well, there's a few things that you can do with Google Sheets that are really helpful. Number one is you can graph your data. You can explore your data. Think of yourself as an explorer. You're out there in really a new area and you're trying to find out what's all around you and what's the best way forward. In Google Sheets, you can do that with graphs like this multiple variable timeline. It can help you find the places of greatest value and help lead you in that particular direction. Google Sheets can also help you sort and filter through your data. Now, you got a collection of tea bags, put them in little boxes. It makes it easier to see what you have and also to see what you're missing. In the data world, you can sort your data by whatever categories you want. You can filter it. Here I'm filtering by a couple of different categories. If you've got a business, you can find new clients that are in your database and focus on them. Or you can find open accounts and you can focus on them and take care of it. And once you find the data that's most important to you, you can calculate things about that data and you can summarize it. Really, it's a way of bringing things into focus. The entire point of data analysis is to simplify things in a way that helps you reach practical goals. You want to bring it into focus. Sometimes the focus analogy really can be pretty literal. Here I have a set of almost 1400 numbers and it's completely overwhelming. But over here on the right, you can see that the mean, the average is 547.5 and the maximum is 999. I've got conditional formatting that highlights where those 999s are and also where the minimum values of 100 are. It helps you sort through the haystack and find the needles that are going to be of most use to you. Finally, believe it or not, spreadsheets and Google Sheets can help you work creatively. Now, not necessarily to create your own art, but if you're an artist, you will find out that Google Sheets can help you free up some time and some cognitive bandwidth to focus on the things that are most important to you. And you can be creative in spreadsheets. Here's one that I use when planning a big trip around the world with my family. I actually had to get a spreadsheet to help figure out who was going to sit where on all of the plane rides. Or you can use a spreadsheet to help you make a decision about what you want to focus on in your business to help you reach both your personal and professional goals. I'll give you examples of all of these things. And as you go through the course, you can follow along by downloading the files that we have at this address, datalab.cc slash tools slash GSH, that stands for Google Sheets, zero one. So that's datalab.cc slash tools slash GSH zero one. Download the sheets, follow along, and really try Google Sheets. And what you'll find is that it's going to help you listen to your data and find your way in your own work. Thanks for joining me. I'm excited to have you here, and I'm excited to hear from you about how working with data and a simple tool like Google Sheets can help you find better value in your own work. Before we really get started in this course, there's one important piece of advice I 
always have to tell everybody. And that is when you're working with data, always do pictures first. The idea is you want to take a look at your data, see what's in front of you, get the context, get the big picture, maybe zoom in on some smaller things, but you need to start with a visual analysis. In other words, first graphs, then numbers. As far as I'm concerned, the graphs are the analysis and the numbers are simply a way of lending precision to the numbers. I always tell my students when I teach statistics that every single thing we do in the class can be done visually. You can graph it or you can calculate it with numbers. That's possible too. But graphs and visuals come first. Now, I can't talk about this without sharing the world's best known example within the statistics community. It's called Anscombe's Quartet. A statistician, Charles Anscombe, back in the 70s, somehow found a set of data that did something very unusual. We have four small sets of data here. And what you need to see is that these summary statistics on the bottom, the sample size, the mean, that's the average, the standard deviation, a measure of how spread out things are, the correlation between the two variables, and the regression equation with the slope and the intercept. See those numbers right there? They're the same as those numbers right there, are the same as those numbers right there, are the same as those numbers right there. So, based on a cursory numerical analysis, these four data sets are identical. On the other hand, when you graph it, you see it doesn't really hold up. Here's the first set of data. This is a nice, normal looking regression equation. Things are scattered around a little bit on this line. This is what we're expecting in regular analysis. On the other hand, the second pair of variables has this really clear but curved relationship. Now, the kind of analysis we usually do is looking for straight lines because that's the simplest possible way of describing an association between two things. You can draw a straight line through this, but you're doing damage to the relationship because really you need to be modeling the curve. There are ways to do that, but they're relatively advanced. And personally, I've never had to deal with them. The third set of variables, you see, we've got this really strong straight line, but we've got one number, boop, that's popping up and it's an outlier. And the immediate question is, what's going on with that number? Why is it out of line? Because if you're doing, for instance, a manufacturing process, that might indicate something's broken. It might just be a sensor, that would be nice, but it could be something about the manufacturing process. Again, our standard approach doesn't deal well with outliers and anomalies. And so you got to be careful about that. And then the last one set for is a very bizarre, really kind of a pathological data set where all of the numbers are jammed over here on the left with this one extreme outlier on the right, which would normally be an indication that something has gone terribly, terribly wrong in the data gathering. And so simply by looking at them, you can see that there's an enormous difference, even though based on common statistical measures, they were identical. Now, these are artificial data sets. Charles Anscombe had to work very hard to find these four sets of data, but diverged so much graphically. But closer to real life, there are other reasons why you would want to do a graphical analysis first. So for instance, take this. This is potential data about donations to a nonprofit organization by month. And you can see that on the left side, things are motoring along kind of fine, about 5,000 bucks a month, great. And then suddenly, halfway through, it more than doubles. And it settles down a little bit, then it goes up another 10,000. Then it settles down, then it goes up another 10,000. And then it drops by 50%. The graphical analysis, just a simple line here, lets you know, we've got things going on, and we need to figure out what's making it jump up at each of these times, because maybe we can do more of that. And then also, what's making it drop off so much at the end. This is the way that even a visual analysis can guide the follow up questions and can guide the actions that you take within your organization as a way of better understanding what's happening and allowing you to maximize your effectiveness and your efficiency in reaching your own goals. And besides, there's another thing. People are very good at visual analysis. It's a high information density medium. And so by getting a picture, by getting visuals, 
you're going to get a lot more insight than you could with simple tables of numbers. And so the moral of all of this is simply always start by looking. Remember, begin with graphs and then follow them up with any numerical analysis that you want to do. In doing so, you'll get a lot more insight and you'll avoid a lot more problems on the way of getting to the information that you need. If we're going to be on the same page and understand what we're talking about in here, we need to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a spreadsheet. So the vocabulary that I use when describing it can make some sense. First thing is the actual document that we're in in Google Sheets is just called a spreadsheet and Microsoft Excel is called a workbook. And a spreadsheet can consist of more than one page, each of which has a tab down here at the bottom. In Excel, these are called worksheets, and in Google Sheets, they're just called sheets. And that's where you actually do your work. Now, each sheet consists of a number of columns, vertical columns, that have letters to indicate what column you're in. This is column D right here. And they have rows that are numbered row number one, row number two. And what that means is that at the intersection of each column and each row is a cell. So right here, I've got one cell, that's one box, one data container within a Google Sheet that can put something in it. And it has an address. This is cell B2. So you always give the column name letter first, that's B in this case, and the row number second, B2. This here is C3. This right here is B6. This is A4. And so that's the address. You have cells that make a spreadsheet that are arranged in vertical columns and horizontal rows. Now, there's a lot of other things you can do here. One thing is I showed you, you can have multiple tabs. And those allow you to have different kinds of information or arrange things in different ways on each one. Each tab also has a little drop down arrow right next to it that allows you to do things like duplicate the tab or change the color of the tab. There we go. Now we've got a little bit of color right there. I'm going to turn that off actually. Or to see a list of all the tabs, that's good if you've got a lot of them, or to add a new tab, add a sheet. And then when you come up to the top of the spreadsheet, now a lot of times the first row is for the names of the columns, the variable names. And you might want that to stay where it is. So if you scroll up, it doesn't disappear. You can do that by freezing a row, or you can also freeze columns. And that means that they will stay there. Now there's a few different ways to do that. One of them is to come up here to view and hit freeze and say the first row or the first two rows or wherever I am right now and columns. I personally find it easier to come over here and get this little thick line right here. And when it turns into a hand, you just click on that and drag it down. And now the thick lines right here. And you can see that when I scroll up and down, that first row will stay put. You can do the same thing with columns. If you want, for instance, this one to always show column A, just come over here until you are, have a little hand and then drag it over. And now column A will always show. And that's called freezing rows and columns. And it's a way of making it easier to navigate your spreadsheet. Also, when you come up to the top here, you'll find that you have a little drop down menu that shows up in each of these, including the ability to sort an entire sheet by values in a column. So I can click this and now it sorts the entire sheet by this column right here. If I want to get back to where I was, I could either do undo or I could just come and sort by a different variable. I sort by ID, sort from ascending values from A to Z. You can also sort descending, that's from Z to A. You also have a number of toolbars up here. Those are familiar with any other program you've been using. There is one special function I do want to draw to your attention. And that is way down here in the bottom corner, we have something that's sometimes called the quick sum box. And what it is, let me highlight a few numbers here. I've highlighted some numbers. And now when I come down here, you'll see it gives me the sum. I actually use this a lot. If I'm putting in dollars, I'm putting in values, I can get an immediate sum by just dragging over a few numbers and getting their total. You can also click on it and see a whole lot of other things, the average, the minimum, maximum, 
the count, the number of scores, and the number of numbers. There's only numbers here, so we're fine. But that's a way to get immediate information without even having to write a formula. So the important thing is a spreadsheet consists of individual sheets or pages, each of which has cells that are arranged into vertical columns, which are named with letters, and horizontal rows, which are named with numbers. And as we go through the other videos in this course, you'll see there's a huge number of things you can do within each document in Google Sheets. More than anything, a spreadsheet like Google Sheets is a container for data. And one of the important things to remember is that data comes in lots of different forms. A lot of it's numerically based, but even then you can format it in many different ways. And there is also non numeric data. And Google Sheets can handle a huge amount of this. And I want to show you some of those variations so you know what you can put in and adapt to your own purposes. The most obvious one, of course, is just plain old numbers, like this integer, 1587. You put those in there, Google Sheets will usually put them flush right, text is usually flush left. You can type those in, you can get a lot out of just those kinds of counting numbers. On the other hand, you can also get proportions, which are read like percentages. So this is 0 0.87 is the same as 87%. In fact, if you want to see it as a percentage, you can just take that proportion and you can click here on the format as percent key. And there it is. It even gives you two decimal places, but it's obviously 87%. You also have the option of just typing it in as 87%. I'll do it like this. And that also works as a percent. If I press the percent sign there, now you see how it works. Now, there's one thing you don't want to do, and that is type in a number 87 and then think if you do this, it's going to turn it into 87%. It turns it into 8,700%, which is obviously not what you want. So you need to start with a proportion, the 0.87, and it turns it into percentages. You can also put in a number like pi, and you can decrease the decimals, which is good because pi has infinite decimals. So we can make it a little smaller if you want. Or if you have a number with a lot of decimals already entered, and I'm using the pi function here, you can increase the decimals. I don't know that you really need a lot more, but they're available if you want them. Now, often the information you're going to be entering into a spreadsheet is going to be financial. You can have money, you're going to be keeping track of purchases and payments. And you have several different options. One is the accounting format. So if you're an accountant, you're familiar with this, but you come up to format to number, and then come down here to accounting. And what it does is it puts the comma in for the thousands, it puts the dollar sign way over here. Okay, that's pretty easy. You can also do financial formatting, which is similar in certain ways. I'll come down here. And you'll see it puts in the comma, but otherwise it doesn't have the dollar sign in it formats a little bit differently. And there's also currency. And you can set your local currency in Google Sheets. I'm going to use dollars, that's where I am. And so you can see now it puts a little bit differently. And it's three different ways of representing the same information. Now, I realize they're slightly different from each other, it becomes a little more pronounced when you make the numbers negative. So I'm going to put a negative there. And now you see it puts it in parentheses. That's a common thing in accounting. And with financial, it also puts it in parentheses. But when I come to currency, and I put a negative, it sticks it in front of the dollar sign. So a few different ways of dealing with money, depending on what's the most common practice in the work that you do. You can also put in dates, you just type them in seven slash 16, it'll format them. And then I'll show you in another video, there's a lot you can do with dates in Google Sheets. And you can also use time. So for instance, 10, 10, 31, just enter it as hours and then colon, minutes, colon, and seconds. So those are all numbers, and there's a lot of things you can do with numbers, but Google Sheets is able to handle a lot more than that. It's able to handle, well, for instance, it can handle text. So you can just type in words, and it turns out there's a lot of functions that allow you to deal with words, and I'll give you examples of those in a later movie. You can put in web links. If you type in a valid web address, I just typed in datalab.cc, my address, 
it recognizes that as HTTP, although it should be HTTPS because I have an SSL certificate. And those are live links, you can click on them, and it'll take you there. So here, for instance, I have my website data lab now opening because I had it here in the cell. The same thing works, you can put email addresses in there, it'll work a lot of different ways. You can put web data, this is an interesting one. This is a special function that calls in Google Finance data. So this is today's stock price for Google. $1,066 a share. And by the way, notice we get this little uh, disclaimer down here at the bottom. If I were to delete that, the disclaimer would go away. Of course, you can use formulas, and I've used a few of them already. I can have a lot more to say about formulas. So for instance, the formula that pulls up this data is Google Finance, and then in parentheses and uh, quotation marks, Goog, because that's the uh, symbol for Google and financial markets. And one other interesting thing you can do in Google Sheets that you can't do in every spreadsheet is you can include images. Now, this is an image that is on the web. It's, it's my company logo. And you do image, and then you put the URL for that image in quotes. Nice thing is if I make this cell bigger, that you know it increases in size as well. So you can put an image in a cell if you can link it from a URL. I'm going to put that one back to where it was. And then finally, you have the option of including floating images and a number of other things. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to come right here to insert. You can put in a chart, an image, a drawing, a form, check boxes, comments, and I'll talk about a lot of those. Let me just insert an image for right now. The one thing you need to know when you include an image, I'm just going to get one off of my desktop. I got my data lab icon. The one thing you need to know is that it's a floating image. And so it's not in the cell, you can drag it around. It's also really big, I'm going to make it smaller. So it's not linked to the cell. And that's a little different from this web image that we have in the cell. But it is possible to include this information, especially if you're trying to build up a repository or even have sort of a branding with your uh, spreadsheets, it gives you many different options. And so what you can see from all of this is that Google Sheets is able to serve as a container for a lot of different kinds of data, each of which might arise in different circumstances in your own work. Once you have your data in Google Sheets, you have a lot of options for how you format the data. Now, this is mostly cosmetic in terms of changing the appearance of the data, but it's also something that can help you organize the data that makes it much easier to follow the argument and bring things to your attention. Let me give you some of the really obvious things. If you've ever used a computer before, this is going to be familiar. So first off is you get to change the font. The default font in Google Sheets is Arial, which is very clean and it works well in a lot of situations. On the other hand, maybe you want a different font. Maybe you want something like Sorts Mill Gaudi. That's one that I like. And you come up here and you click on fonts and you go to Sorts Mill Gaudi. Now you may not have that because it's not installed by default. If it's not, you just go to more fonts that takes you to a web page and you can add a huge number of fonts. Don't add all of them because then it gets confusing, but find something that you need works for your purposes and you can add it in here and it becomes available and it becomes available to anybody who uses your document. Another option is something like Consolus. If you're using code, a fixed width font is pretty common. You can change the font size. So you can make it smaller. It's 10 point by default. Eight point is, well, I've got my screen zoomed in super big, so it's not too hard to see. You can make it a lot bigger. And obviously this is something you might want to do if you are uh, putting in headings or titles. Now, one thing to be aware of is you're not limited to the choices that are here. So for instance, I put 20 point, but I only had 24 point, just come up here, select the number and type what you want. There's a 20 point font. You can also do the bold. All you got to do is do command or control B or you can click on that. Same thing with italics. I'll just come up here, you can do the other command. 
and, and strike through. I don't use strike through very often, but it might be important for your purposes. Okay, those are all quick and easy. The next one is text color. Obviously, if you've used a computer before, you know how to do this stuff. But color can be an important indicator of both importance and directing focus. And that can be really important when you're putting together visualizations or making a table that you're going to have to come back to and you need help interpreting it or you're sharing it with other people. So I can come down and select the color. There's red text. You can also do fill color. That's an option. So if I do the fill, it puts in the cell. Now, by the way, when you have a dark fill like this, you usually want to come and pick white text to go on top of it so it's easier to tell what's going on. You can do cell borders, and I do these only lightly. I try to keep it pretty clean. To do cell borders, select the cells that you want to have borders on, and then come up to the borders. And you know, you can put cells borders on everything, but that's kind of a nightmare. You don't want to do that. There are times I have find, however, that it's nice to have just horizontal lines going through the data. It's relatively easy to direct the line across the rows in a table, especially when it's printed. But I'm going to take that out for right now. Yeah, but cell borders are an option. Row height, you can snap it to fit or you can have a consistent size. Now, snap to fit means something that happened automatically here. You saw how that got bigger. I can drag it down so it's super huge or I can bring it back up. Either way, you saw when I changed the font size, it automatically changed the height of the row so that the text would fit. Similar to that, you have options for column width. You can snap to fit or do a consistent size. This actually requires a small demonstration. So I'm going to put three column headings here. And I'm going to make them bold because I often find it's helpful to have column headings in bold. And they're different sizes. If you want to snap to fit, you can just select these three columns and then double click here on the right one. And then it changes the width of each column so that the, it adjusts to the size of the text. There may be situations in which you want to do that. On the other hand, I find that having different size columns, it can be a little disturbing. So you can also do a consistent size. So for instance, I can select all three of them here, and I can make all of them the size of this last one. If I just click this and drag it around a little and I let go, now all of them will be the same size. And that usually is easier to read because you have this uniform movement across the document. In addition to that, and maybe this is a solution, you can do text alignment. Now, all the text that I've got right here so far is flush left. You can, of course, come over here and you can center it. You can also make it flush right. But text is usually flush left and that works best. On the other hand, if you're doing a column, you may want to have centered text for columns, especially with the columns are different sizes. That makes things a little easier. You also have the option of changing vertical alignment. But to make that clear, let me show you one other thing. And that is text wrapping where it says overflow, wrap and clip. So let's make this a little more obvious by making all of these smaller, narrower. Okay, so you see how this one that says extra, extra, extra long is now too big. One of the options I have is to come right here and to change it so that it is wrapped. And that has it, you know, go to two lines. It is not breaking very well. If I put in a space here, it should break better because it treats it as a single word. There we go. Now it's breaking better. On the other hand, maybe you want these other ones on the bottom, but maybe you want to vertically orient them towards the top, towards the middle. Anyhow, whatever works best for your purposes. These are a lot of different ways that you can format the document. Again, the point here is not to noodle away your time and just kind of mess with it because you can. But the point of it is to organize the document to make it clearer. You want clarity and you want direction. You want to guide the eye through your document to make the comprehension and analysis easier. And formatting, even with this small range of options, is going to make that a lot easier to do in Google Sheets. When you're getting ready to work with your data, you'll find that your life becomes a lot easier if you have tidy data. Now, this is kind of a funny term, but it actually refers to something specific 
within the data science world. I want you to know that if you go to Google and type in tidy data, two of the first three are going to take you directly to the journal article in the Journal of Statistical Software by Hadley Wickham that originally explained the idea of tidy data. And you can also take you to a page on uh, the R project site that gives a lot more information about what is meant by tidy data. The idea is that data that is tidy is easier to manipulate and is easier to take from one software package to another. Now, this is where spreadsheets are a little problematic because spreadsheets are amazingly flexible and they allow you to do a lot of things that might suit your purposes when you're creating the spreadsheet, but they make exporting or sharing with others kind of a headache. So for instance, I've got a spreadsheet right here that does some of the things that I hope you don't have to deal with. First and foremost, we've got a problem here of merged cells. This is when you take a single cell and you spread it all the way across these other ones sort of as a header, there's a merged cell, there's a merged cell. This one is 15 cells merged together and it's smack in the middle of everything. The problem with these is they change the way the spreadsheet functions. So for instance, if I come here and click on column F, well, you see it's selecting this entire first cell and then it's selecting all of this. But if I then hit bold, it only changes this one. And if I try to hit bold back, it doesn't do anything. I have to do undo. And if I were to try to move it, I'm just going to come right here and try to move it. And oops, it just doesn't want to work because of the merged cells. Merged cells are things that people sometimes do to get title centered, but they make it really difficult to work in the day state. So you don't want that. The other thing that you don't want is you don't want to have mixed up labels, you don't want to have things spread across in different tables that might work for an individual project. But again, if you're planning on sharing it with other people, or if there's the possibility they might take the data out of Google Sheets and into some statistical application or programming language, they're going to need something else. Specifically, tidy data means that each column is the same thing as a variable. Variables and columns are identical. And that rows and observations are the same thing. And so we need to get some of this cleaned up. And so another thing you can see, by the way, is with tidy data, is that all of the data needs to be in the spreadsheet. So this is an important piece of information potentially, but it needs to be in a column to mark pieces. Also, we've got a comment kind of hiding right here. And it tells us something that maybe this person could be coded as being West or an East, depending on how we want to do it. This is not the sort of thing you want to have in a comment because if you export the data, you lose all of that information. And so let's take a few looks at how to tidy things up to make them easier to work with and less problematic. First one is get rid of all the merged cells. Get rid of those titles we had across the top. And then the information that said the first 10 were uh, surveyed in person, make a new column and put that in there. So now we have that information in the spreadsheet, it's not included somewhere else. I decided not to make a change for the comment because I didn't think that was necessarily critical. If it were, then you might want to have two locations, starting location and ending location for each person. Now there's a couple of other problems. One is that we have gender is just coded in a crazy way. We don't even know what the zeros and ones are. F and M we can guess. And so we need to do a little bit of data cleaning right now. I'm going to come here to this tab. And you see, I've done two things. Number one is I took the variable and I changed its name from gender to female. Because when you have a variable that you're going to treat as dichotomous, it's really easiest if you use a zero for no, a one for yes, and you name the variable by what the one is. In this case, I decided to assign female the one. It's arbitrary, you can do whichever one you want. But for anybody who put down that they were female, I put a one. For anybody who put down they were male, I put a zero. Similarly, for the method of surveying them, I decided that if they got surveyed online, I would give them a one. And if it were anything else, like in person, it would be a zero. And so I've cleaned that up. But there's one more step that we need to do, and it has to do with this one right here. We've got information here about the location the person is in. This is a different level of measurement. Everything else is at the individual level. This is now about a larger group that they're in, and we're repeating a lot of information. 
if you've ever worked with a SQL database or a relational database, you know that you set up separate tables for different levels of measurement. You want to do the same thing with tidy data. So you keep information about the individual, but then if you have this information at a different level that's repeated, you put that into a separate table. And it's just a tiny little table. And then we only have to indicate whether a person's location was north, east, south, or west. And we can get the rest of this information from this table. And when you do those things, what you'll end up with ultimately is two separate sheets. You'll have one sheet that contains all the individual level information, where each column is a variable, each row is an observation, and all of the relevant information is put into those variables and columns. And you'll have a second sheet that contains the variables for the other level of measurement. Now, again, this is mostly important if you're going to be exporting your data so it can be analyzed in another program. If you're working entirely within Google Sheets and it's never going somewhere else, you might be okay doing whatever you want. Just be aware that the flexibility that you get with spreadsheets gives you a lot of room for creativity, but it can potentially create some headaches. And so, when in doubt, take the tidy data approach, keep your data clean, and make it easy to work with, easy to analyze, and easy to get meaning out of. Your analytical life becomes much simpler and much faster if you're able to collaborate with other people. And fortunately, that's one of the things that Google Sheets does best. To share a document, to share a spreadsheet with somebody, all you need to do is come up to click on the blue share button. And there's a lot of different ways you can share with people. Now, the most direct is to simply put in their email address right here. Here is a fake email address that I just got, data at superito.com. And you have the option of assigning different levels of sharing, that that person actually can change the document, they can edit it, or they can simply make comments on it, but they can't change the actual text, or they can simply view it. And you can say, here is the document. And it will email that person and let them know that they've got the document and then they get into it and they can start working on it with you. You also have the option of sharing with a link. So for instance, you can say that anybody at your organization, if you have a Google business account, or you can click on more here, you can share anybody who has a link or public on the web, which is what I've done on this one. And I've set it so that anybody who has the link can view it. I could set it up so they could comment or edit, but view is going to work best in this case. I hit save. And then as long as people have this very long link, but you click copy link, and I'm going to open up a new incognito window, click it like this. And now this is the way that anybody can see it. They can see the document. They can't change it. It's giving me a little blurb about updates here. Here it says view only. That's fine. But you can see that other people, this is my professional account with Data Lab. This is my personal account. And even though this person can't edit it, they can download it as a Microsoft Excel file or a CSV or TSV file. And they can start working it on it themselves. I'm going to close this one. Now, one of the nice things about the way that sharing works in Google Docs, I'm going to just delete this one. I don't really want to share with my fake email address. I'm going to press cancel and done. But when you're sharing, you can see who's sharing right here. That's my personal account. This is my company account. And you're able to see where they are in the document. So for instance, I'm going to be in this cell right here. But I can tell that the other person is surrounded in pink, same as we have up here, is in this cell. And if I go to that account, you can see I have the document open. That's where I am. You can see that I'm now sharing with my company account. And it's a good way to see who's working on it, where they are, and to start collaborating to get your analysis up and running as fast as possible. Sharing an individual sheet within Google Sheets may accomplish your purposes, but often you're going to work with people on more than one thing or there's more than one resource you need to share. And in that case, rather than sharing each of them individually, it's a lot easier in Google Drive to share a folder. To do that, all you need to do is come to the folder that you want to share and you get it selected. And you can either come up here to get a shareable link 
you can click on this to go share it or you can for instance option click on it right here and do share and then you're going to add the person you want to share it with you can put in a specific email address and then with that include a message to them or you can get a link that you can share with people you've got a lot of different choices here I personally have it said that anybody on the web could actually search for this they could searchable on Google and get it or they have a specific link lots of other ways and you also have the option of whether they can view it see the contents or whether they can organize add and edit information within each of these now right now I have it set to just view and let's see well if you're looking at these files you know how it works but I'm going to copy the link and I'm going to open up an incognito window so I'm not logged into this one and I'll enter that link and go to it and what you have here are the three different files I've got a little icon file you can look at that one it's just a little data lab icon I've got an empty document that says we're sharing this this is where it's shared and I've got the spreadsheet that I'm working on right now and when I open this one it gives us this little advertisement lets us know that new things are coming you can see who's logged into it that's my personal account that's my company account and although you can only view it here you do have the option of downloading the file just as you did when we were sharing individual files the nice thing of course is anything that anybody puts into the folder is automatically shared with everybody else who has access to it and when you're working on a project with more than one step in it say for instance you have a presentation you have a report you have several different files that build up to it sharing a folder is going to be a faster more efficient and more effective way of collaborating within Google Sheets if you're going to work with data you have to have some data and you have to have it in Google Sheets now the fundamental way to do this is to enter the data directly into Google Sheets and there's a lot of times where that's the preferable solution if you're going to be working with a statistical program like SPSS or SAS, it's so much easier to put it into a spreadsheet. There's a lot of advantages to it. One is it's really easy to share and have several people working simultaneously on what you're doing here. Now, I want to show you if you're going to be entering data manually, and say, for instance, you're going to be entering it based on paper surveys that you have, there's a few things you want to do to make your life a little easy. First off, you want to have what's called tidy data. That's a term developed by Hadley Wickham, who works with the statistical programming language R. And it means that a variable is the same thing as a column, and that a case is the same thing as a row, and there's just no funny business going on in your sheet. So let's start with this one. If you're entering paper, the first thing you need to do is have an ID number so that you can find the piece of paper in case something gets entered wrong. Now, uh, you may need to get out a pen and write these numbers on a piece of paper. And then maybe you start putting in the questions. Now, I want to show you something kind of neat that Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel are able to do. And what that is, is propagating. So if you take a pattern that's easy to follow, so for instance, I like to type Q01, where Q is for question, and then do Q02 for question two. Mind you, I'm not doing Q1, Q2 because it's going to think that means quarter one, quarter two in the year. But if I do the leading zeros, especially if there's more than nine questions, this is important. I can select those first two, then I can just drag them over and it will propagate and fill in with the same pattern. You can do that for however many you have. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this top column, I'm going to put it in bold, and maybe I will even center the columns you don't have to and there's a there is a precedent for text columns being justified to the left and numbers being justified to the right you know it's up to you sometimes I just like to do this so that the labels are directly above the numbers and it's a little easier to see what's going on and then I'm going to freeze the top row by simply dragging this bar down and now when you scroll up and down that top row stays put if you're going to be entering data from pieces of paper, like I said, you need ID numbers. And so you go like this, one, two, three, and it can propagate that same pattern. So I'll drag it down a little bit. And now we've got the numbers. As long as those match up with what's on your paper, you're good to go. If several people are entering the data, then you might want to be able to separate who has what. And 
the first person might start with 101 and then 102. So the one, the first, the hundred indicates the person, the second number indicates which one they're working on. And then the next person can start with 201 and 202. It's okay that there are gaps that you go straight from 107 to 201. You just can't have repeats. That's the important thing. And this way, people can be working separately on their own computers, and they can be entering the data simultaneously in the same sheet, and it gets in there. It's wonderful. And so the very simple method for entering this is to type in a number. Let's say you've got a rating scale, and people are putting in a number. And then I hit tab, go to the next one, or a right arrow, and 9. And I can go through and enter like this. I'm just hitting tab at each point. When I get to the end, I hit return. And it takes me back to where I started on the first line. And I can go on like this. I can type in the data however I want. If you have missing data, if a person didn't answer a question, it's best to simply leave it blank. And then if they typed in something, you can put in 8, although I would hope that they didn't type in something on what's supposed to be a numerical variable. But the idea here is you can put in whatever you want, and you enter the data all the way through. And now you have entered your data manually, and you're prepared to do subsequent analyses. Although it's possible for you to enter all your data manually in Google Sheets or another spreadsheet, and again, there may be situations where you need to do that, life is so much easier if you can simply import the data and dump it in there and get going. Now, what I want to show you is slightly different from importing a file into Google Drive, the place that stores files. So for instance, you can take an Excel file, drag it into Google Drive, and it can store it in either the native Excel format or convert it to a Google Sheets document. I actually want to show you how to import something straight into a sheet in an existing Google Sheet. And to do this, we're simply going to go up to File, and then come down here to Import. And when you do that, it's going to ask you to import something. I'm going to go to Upload and select a file from my computer. Now, actually, let me show you what I have here. I have three files here that are identical except for their format. They're all called import. And they're just data files that have an ID number, a date, a response ID, five rating scale questions, and a zip code. It's, it, this is made up data. This is in Excel as an XLSX spreadsheet. This over here is the same data in a CSV or comma separated value spreadsheet. And this one in the middle here is a, a text document, but they're still separated by tabs. And so it's identical information in all of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to Google Sheets. And I'm going to select one of these files. I'm just going to take the import.csv. So I'm going to hit open. And then it's going to bring up a little dialog box and ask me some questions about what I want to do. Do I want to create a totally new spreadsheet? No, I don't even want to insert a new sheet. I want to replace the current sheet. So it's the sheet that I already have the information on, put it there. And if I want to tell it what the separator is, a tab comma or whatever, but it can detect it automatically. And I'm using a comma separated values, so it's, it's easy to deal with. And then convert text to numbers and dates, yes. And I hit import. It takes just a second. And here it is. It's in my new sheet. And so I've got my data, all the rows and the columns are intact. If I want to make my life a little easier, I'll freeze the top row. And maybe I will come here. Maybe I'll select the whole thing and make it all flush right, except for these two, which I'll put then back to flush left. And my data set's ready to go. And now I can start analyzing. So importing directly into an existing Google Sheet, very quick and easy way to get up and running with Google Sheets. I have an untested theory that the single most common container for data sets in the entire world is spreadsheets. And of those, I think the majority are probably going to be Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. So for instance, if somebody sends you a spreadsheet, or if you download a spreadsheet from online, it might be in Excel format. And even though it's really easy to import Excel directly into Google Drive or into Google Sheets, I do want to show you, you also can just resort to plain old copy and paste. So I've got a spreadsheet here that's import, and it's the same data I've been using for some other examples. 
I'm going to select the entire set by doing shift and then command or control with space. I get the rectangle. I'm going to hit copy and then just go back to Excel sheets and hit paste. I'm going to do control or command V in this case. And there's my data. I'm ready to go. On the other hand, it may be that you also are going to be using data from web pages on tables. I do this occasionally. And so, for instance, if we go to this next tab, I have a link here to a page in Wikipedia on Nobel laureates that has a table in it. So let's open this page and it talks about who's won the Nobel Prize, which is a wonderful thing to do. And here we have a table with a list of everybody who's ever won a Nobel Prize from 1901 down through 2017. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this. I find it works the best if I start at the bottom right and I just click and I drag up and I'm going to go up to 1901. Just have to not go past it. Almost there. And I'm going to copy the headings too. So now I let go. I've got that all selected. I do Command or Control C to copy it. Then I'm going to go back to my spreadsheet. I'm going to come to this cell right here. And all I do is I hit Command or Control V to paste it in. Now, this is going to do something slightly weird. And that is, these are all links. So I've got a million links in this table. And truthfully, that may cause problems as I'm trying to deal with the data. So I'm actually going to ask Google Sheets to not paste it as links, but to paste it as plain text. I do that by coming to this little clipboard that pops up when you first paste something. And I say, give me the values only. And now you see it just turns into unformatted text. And that's a great way to go. I can then if I want to, I can delete this first row. I can then lock that first row, I can put it in bold. I can highlight the columns and then just double click right here to resize them. And now I've got a data set that I can work with. This is great. I do want to show you one tiny more little trick about copying and pasting in Excel. I'm going to go to this sheet called Paste Transpose. And I'm just going to type in a little bit of data here. Now, I showed you in another video how Google Sheets is able to fill in a pattern if you do one, two, three, it just keeps continuing. Or if you do Q01 or Q02, it can also do this with things like days of the week. So I've got Sunday, Monday here, and I'm just going to highlight those two. And I'll drag it down a little bit. And look, we have now have the whole week. Now, what I want to show you is if you want to switch it from being arranged vertically in a column to being the column headers, what you want to do is a special kind of paste called a transpose or transposition. So I'm going to copy this by hitting Control or Command C. Then I'll just come over here and I'm going to do a control click. It's a, actually a two finger click on my trackpad and go to Paste Special. And we've got a few options here. The one I want to show is this one right here Paste Transpose. And it flips it around from the rows to the columns. And if you're trying to set up your data for analysis, this can save you a lot of stress about trying to rearrange things manually. And so that's just one final tip on getting data by copy and paste into Google Sheets. When you're working with data, one of the truisms is that about 80% of the time is spent simply getting the data ready. And when you're working in Google Sheets, you've got a few things that can help you get the data ready, especially in terms of keeping notes for yourself and communicating with others. In this video, I want to show you how to make notes, which are a little different from comments, which I'm going to show you another time. A note is something that you put in a cell that is an addition to that cell. So for instance, let's try this. In this page, I've got three different sets of data. I've got days of the week, I've got months of the year, and I've got a series of odd numbers. There are a couple of mistakes in this one. So for instance, we have June appears twice here. One possibility is to make a note here. I can either right click on it, that's a two finger click, and I can insert a note, or I can come up to the menu here 
and do insert note. And what I'm going to say is June appears twice. Then when I click away from that, you can see that we've got this little box here, this little corner, and if I hover over the cell, then the note appears. Now the only trick is somebody has to actually be on the sheet to know that that's there. I'll go to my other account where I'm sharing this. And you can see that that note now appears. It doesn't say who did it. It's just a note that's in the cell. Now some people unfortunately try to put actual data there stuff that you need to know to interpret it, please don't ever do that. This is something that can be there temporarily in terms of drawing attention to something, even though it's not very effective at drawing, but adding a little more context to what you have in the cell. Now, a more effective way is to actually make a comment, which is what I want to show you in the next video. When you're collaborating with others on your data, you want to be able to communicate back and forth. And sometimes the best way is to put comments on specific cells within a spreadsheet. Now, you can do notes, which I showed you previously, but those are just kind of passive and they're there. They don't draw attention to themselves and not attributed to anybody. And they're really not as helpful as an actual comment. Let me show you how this is going to work. I'm going to highlight two errors in this spreadsheet. One is I have the month of June twice. Now to insert a comment, I can do a few different things. I can come up here to insert, or I can use the keyboard shortcut, which can be a little different on Macintosh, which is what I'm using and Windows computers. Or you can also right click on it or option click on it and come down to insert comment. That's what I'm going to do right now. And then you see that it brings up who's making the comment. And this is my personal account. And then it's going to say, why is this repeated? And then I can do command or control enter or to hit the comment. And so that's that rephrase. And so that's now there. Now let's go to the other account to see what it looks like in the discussion. And here this highlights that there's a comment there. So it's drawing attention to itself in the way that a note didn't. And it lets me know who's asking the question. And I can then click on this and say, because June was so good, we wanted it twice. And I can click on reply. And now we're both in this thread. And then I can come down here. Oh, look, it brings up my whole Google Plus profile. And if you want to bring in somebody else, you could click on this. You could say, for instance, let's put data at sample.com. I don't think that's a real email address. What do you think? And this is a way of bringing in additional people to the conversation, inviting them and highlighting the comment for them. Now I'm not actually going to send this because that's not a real email address. I'm going to hit cancel to discard the comment. But the comment is there and you can ask for information, you can propose a resolution. And when you finally come around to it, you can go like this, you can say, well, let's fix it. Let's do July. And then we've now resolved it. So we can hit resolve. And it hides the discussion, it archives it. And so that is now done, I can go to the other account to see what's happened. And you can see that the comment notification is gone, the comment is gone. And it's fixed. And so this is a really good way of drawing attention to things that need repairing, and then making the action, I'll just highlight that we have one other right here. And I'll insert another comment. This should not be here. It's not odd. Anyhow, that's something you can do uh, for future reference as a way of communicating with others. And it makes organizing the data and getting ready for your analysis a lot easier within Google Sheets. When you're collaborating with other people, sometimes it's sufficient to put notes into the document or to have the comment feature, which invites a discussion, but that's asynchronous. It's not in real time. On the other hand, there are different times when having a real time conversation is going to get you a lot further, a lot faster in your work. Fortunately, Google Sheets makes that kind of conversation really easy with a built in chat functionality. To do that, you have to have at least two people working on the same document. 
I can come over here and see that I've got it's open in my other account. And then I click on this icon which says show chat. And then I simply come down to the chat window, type hello, and it lets me know I've sent them a message. Now let me go to the other account. And it's telling me that there's a message here. Now if I click on this, it just kind of goes away. But if I come up here where I've got my little notification dot, I open up the chat and there it is. Okay. Here I am. What's up? And now I've got this conversation going back and forth. And this allows people to work together in a way to try to solve the issues. It works really well when people are really far apart and maybe for instance a live telephone conversation is not the best idea. This chat history stays there as long as anybody has the document open. So for instance, let me go to my other account and I will close the document here. And then what you get over here is an indication that Barton Polson, that's my other account, has left. If I close the document here and then I open it right back up, I give it a moment to load. And there's actually nothing there because the other person's not even in there anymore. So the chat history disappears once everybody closes the document. But while you're there, it's a great way to have this real time conversation about what's happening in the document, what tasks need to be done, how to interpret and how to apply your insights. Certain skills seem so basic that they don't really seem worth discussing. But it turns out that knowing some of the special tricks can make your life a lot easier. This applies to Google Sheets as it applies to so many other things. And what I want to show you in terms of basic skills is simply how to select data and move it around. Now, obviously, if you want to select just one cell, you get your cursor and you click on that cell and you can move it around by doing the arrows. Here I am driving it around with the arrows. That's selecting one cell. That's easy. If you want to select a column, just come and click on the letter above that column and you've got the entire thing. If you want to select more than one column, click and drag across. Now you've got columns. And the same thing works for rows. Just click on the row number and you select the entire row. You can select several rows as well by clicking and dragging. So that's easy. If you want to select the entire spreadsheet, come up here and click on this area that's to the top left. And that selects everything, every single cell in the entire spreadsheet. Let's come back up to here. Let's say I want to select just this first row. Now, actually, to make this easier, I'm going to maximize my screen so you can see the entire data set. I'm first going to go full screen on my Mac and then I'm going to hide these controls right here. And so now you can see I've got a data set with an empty column right here and I've got an empty row right here. That's going to affect how some of this stuff works. Now, let me come up to here. I'll just stick the cursor right here. If I want to select an entire column, I can do it with the keyboard by doing control and space. And you see what it does is it selects vertically until it thinks it has reached the end of the data. And it thinks it's reached the end because I've got this big empty row right here. So it ignores it. On the other hand, if that row were not empty, let's say I put an X there. And I were to give this a title up here, I'll call that X also. Now it's going to unite the whole data set. I'm going to come back over to here. I'll hit control and space. And now you see it selects down to the bottom because now it sees this all as one unified whole, even though there are gaps in it. So control space selects the entire current column. I'll do control space right here. And if I want to expand my selection, I can do shift and then use an arrow, right arrow or left arrow to get more of what I want. There's a similar command for selecting rows. So let me just hit escape. I'll actually I'll just click right here. And I'll do shift space. And what this does is it selects the entire row in the data rectangle. And if I want to expand that, I can use the down arrow or I can use the up arrow. And that is a way of selecting data, sometimes a little more precisely than dragging through with the cursor. One other thing that you want to know is about moving data. So say for instance, I want to move 
this score so it's on the other side of category. What I do is, you see how I selected it? Now when I come up here, I have a hand. If I just click and drag over, I switched them around. I'll put it back by undoing that move. That's really easy. I do the same thing right here. I'll expand that. I can click and just drag down my data and move it to a new position. And this can be an important way of fixing the way that you've entered things. You can sort things manually with an ID number, but in terms of rearranging variables, the click and drag is by far the easiest way to go. And so the ability to click on individual cells and then expand by doing shift and the arrows or to select rows and columns within the data rectangle by doing control and space or shift and space are great ways to grab the data you need and perform the functions you want. It's a small thing. And again, doesn't always seem worth it mentioning, but it can make your life much quicker and less error prone when working in Google Sheets. One of the most important things you can do for making sense of your data is to first get it sorted, put it in order, because a spreadsheet allows you to do something called data browsing, and it's to actually look at the data that's in front of you. Again, it sounds like a fundamental thing, but it makes a really big difference. Fortunately, this is really easy to do in Google Sheets, and you need to be aware this works a little differently than it does in Microsoft Excel, because when there are gaps in Excel, sometimes things don't sort the way you expect and you can actually terminally mess up the data. But in Google Sheets, it's really easy. Now, what I have is a small data set here with an ID number, then I have a random number, then I got descending and letters and categories and so on. Here's all you have to do to sort. Come here to the top and this little, see, watch how this little arrow shows up. You click on that and then you can sort A to Z, which means ascending, or Z to A, which is descending. You can actually randomize it too. So now I've sorted it descending based on this random number. If you want to sort it by more than one category, what you need to do is to sort it by the last one until the big one. So for instance, I might want to have this category over here. I can show you how, what it looks like when it's sorted. I've got some fours and some ones. By the way, what it's doing is it's sorting it alphabetically, not in terms of meaning. But let's say I wanted to have these numbers sorted within these categories, the scores. So what I have to do is I have to start with the last one. So I'm going to come to score, and I'm going to sort the sheet in ascending values. And then I come next to category, and I sort it by ascending values. And now within four, I've got my one, two, three, three. And so this way I can have a first sort, a second sort. But again, you have to do it kind of in a backwards method. But anyhow, it's a very quick and easy way to get things under control. Also, one of the reasons I mentioned earlier is that it's really important to have an ID row, a column that gives an ID number, is because it makes it possible to get back your original order. I'm just gonna sort this ascending, and I'm right back to where I was to begin with. Sometimes you only need to deal with some of your data. You don't need to see everybody, but you need to see cases that meet specific criteria. Google Sheets allows you to do this very easily with filtering. What you do is when you have your data in front of you is you come over and you click on this icon over here, which is the filter. And when you click that, it selects the data table, it puts the column headers and the row headers in green, and you get these little filter icons. Now, you can do a couple of different things with these. You can select text, you can select scores, you can create formulas. I'll show you a two-step selection for the filter so we can find cases that meet particular criteria. So for instance, let me come over here to category. Let's say I only want to see category one and three. I can deselect these other two, or you can do it the other way. You can clear them all and then select just the ones that you want. Either one works. So one and three, and I click that, and you see it. The other ones are filtered out now. And then if I want to do another layer on top of that, for instance, I can come here to score and I can say, I only want to see 
cases whose score is above a certain value. Now I could select them manually because we only have a few choices here, but I can also come up to filter by condition. And I've got a lot of different choices here with text and date and values. And I'm going to say greater than not greater than or equal to but greater than. And I'm going to put in a three. And when I click that, the other cases are filtered out. And so now, whereas I originally had 19 lines of data, I'm now down to a much smaller number. Now it's kind of hard to tell because it's hiding the row numbers of the cases that were filtered out. But now I only have the six cases that meet my two criteria of being in either category one or three, and having a score greater than three. And so this allows me to find particular cases, say, for instance, people who have made over a certain number of purchases or open requests or people who've been involved an unusually high amount with your organization. This allows you to find those particular cases and give them the attention that they deserve. When you're trying to sort through your data and filter out cases that need special attention, you have the option of either doing what I call ad hoc filters, which are the ones you get when you simply click on the filter icon, and it brings up a menu like this. But you also have the option of doing what are called filter views, which stay with the data and you can have multiple filter views. Let me show you how these are a little different. I'm going to click on new filter view, you have to click on the arrow to get those. And then you see the window looks a little different. We've got this black bar here. And the column headers and row headers are in black. But let's do a filter view. Now what I'm going to do here is let's say let's get the first 10 cases. I'm going to come over here, click on this filter for ID. And then I'm going to say filter by condition, where the value is less than or equal to 10. Okay. When I get that I hit okay. And there we have it and see by the way that the rows now jump from 11 to 20. But what's interesting is I can save this filter, I come up here to where it says name, it says filter one, I just highlight that. And I replace that with uh, let's call it the first 10 cases. And so now that's a saved filter. And if I come over to here, and click on this little side arrow, you can see it's saved right there. Now let's go to none. And so it undoes that one. And let's create another filter view, I'm going to come and click on this right arrow again, say new filter view. And let's replicate a filter I did with the other example on regular filtering. Let's come to category and select just the one and three. So there's that one. And then let's select scores that are greater than three. So greater than three. All right. And now I've got those cases and I can come over here and name that one as category one and three score greater than three. And so that is saved as a filter too. So when I come back here, I have both of those available to me and the ability to turn it all off. So if I want to go see just the first 10 cases, I click like this, I get those. If I want my compound selection, I click like this, and it's different. And if I want to have the entire data set, I simply click none. And all of these are useful. I use it all the time when I have to find cases that have not yet been resolved, and it allows me to see the open cases. And I just select down to those and I'm able to focus on them exclusively. So it's a wonderful way to save the view into your data and also to be able to share it with others. And so that again allows you to sort through your data, focus on the particular cases that are most important and get your analysis done. You may get to a point in your analyses where you don't want to work with just specific collaborators, but you actually want to get out to everybody. Google Sheets allows you to publish your both your spreadsheet and your results to the entire World Wide Web. This is different from sharing via link where people can actually log in and potentially make changes to your folder. This is actually where you can post it as a web page or as a downloadable Excel file or a PDF. And while it makes the most sense to do this with individual graphics, which you can embed in a web page, I want to show you how this works in general. What you need to do is come up to file, and then come down to publish to the web. And when you click on that, you get a few different choices. 
you can publish the entire document or you can publish one of the tabs out of it. I'll do the entire document for right now, but you may have more specific needs. And also, you can publish it as a web page, in which case it'll show up as an HTML web page, or you can do any of these other formats, in which case it will simply initiate an automatic download of the file. So you don't see anything there, it just goes straight to your download folder. Let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to publish the entire thing. I'm going to hit publish. It says, do I want to publish it? Yes, because you don't want to do this stuff by accident. And now I've got this big long web address, I'm going to copy that and go to a private browser, I'm going to open it up. And now you can see now it's not the most attractive or well formatted, but that's because it's a web page and not the actual spreadsheet. Because I published the entire spreadsheet, I have all of these different tabs that are available as you know, hyperlink selections. And so this is one way of sharing things. Now again, this works better if it's graphics that you're sharing, especially if they're interactive graphics. And I'll have an example of those later. But this is one way to get things out and about. The other option, by the way, aside from linking is to embed the information into a website like a WordPress site or Squarespace or your own website. And then you can include the data there so that it's already hosted in house for people, they don't have to go to the link directly, but it's right there in front of them. And any of those methods will allow you to get your data out and your message out to as wide an audience as possible. The last thing I want to say about sharing files and sharing your work is of course that sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes you put stuff in you accidentally delete something or formulas get mixed up at some way long. And there are problems and you may want to be able to back up the work that you did. Fortunately, this is really, really simple in Google Sheets because it has a built in version history. To get to this, all you need to do is come to file and down to version history. Now, one of the interesting things is that you have an option of naming the current version, you can say draft one draft two or clients review or whatever. But let's come here and see the version history. When I click on that, it's going to show me all the different changes that have been made. Now these ones, I mean, if you click open on them, you're going to see a lot more things. And two things, you have the option saying show me only the named version. So I have draft one and the final version, which are my named ones. And then you also have the option saying show the changes. So if I unclick that, it simply shows you the plain document. If you click show changes, it lets you know that all of this got added and it got added by this person in this color, the teal Barton Polson founder. Or if we back up a little more, you can see draft one, and you can see, for instance, that there is information that got added. I think here in notes, you see the number of tabs changes and that this is all new for this one. And so this is an option to hit restore this version, go back in time to the one you had before things got out of hand, you can recover from any mistake in Google Sheets, you can also create these different versions that allow you to have a sort of version control. So you don't have to be a fancy person using GitHub or subversion or something like that. You can use the built in version history in Google Sheets to keep track of your work to recover from errors and see who's contributed what it's a great way of getting accountability and getting recoverability. The first graph I want to show you isn't even technically a Google Sheets graph, it's a hack. It uses a function called repeat to make a bar chart. And it puts it in a cell, which actually is really convenient and makes a lot of other things possible. Let me show you how this works. What I have here is some made up data of the number of social media followers a person might have on several different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And I've counted the number of people. Now you can also do this if you have means averages, and you put the number in there. But let's just see how we do this. I'm going to make a column called chart. And then I'm going to type in equals because I'm using a function and REPT, which stands for repeat. Now when you use the repeat function, the first thing it wants to know is what is it going to repeat? What's it going to put in many times? And you have to put it in quotes, I'm going to do the quote, and then the vertical pipe that's uh, on the US keyboard is above the return key. And then 
you tell it how many times you want it. And that's where I refer over to this cell. And you can see it's giving you a preview of it right there. I'm going to close the formula with the closing parenthesis, hit return. And now I've got 50 pipes. I'll adjust that that show an indication of how many people you have following you on Facebook. What's neat about this is because it's a formula, I can just drag this down like this. And now I've got it for each one of my cells. And so it's really easy to see that we've got about twice as many people here as we have here. As, and that's about twice as many as we have here. It's also really flexible. If you want to draw attention to one particular category, say for instance, you're interested in Instagram, you can just highlight that row. And for instance, you can change its color. And now you've got a bar that matches the color you've put things in. So this is a way to make it easy to find what you're looking for at focus, especially if you have a lot of different categories you're looking at. Plus, this is a flexible procedure. Let me just copy this and paste it down here. Now what we're getting is five more pipes, but you can put anything other than pipes. So for instance, I got a little emoji here, a smiley face with eyes, I'm going to copy that, I'm going to come back over to this. And instead of the pipe, I'm going to do smileys. And so now you got a graphic, you can use any emoji you want, positive, negative, funny ones. But it lets you get a very quick visualization. And it's a great way to start looking at your data. The single most useful chart that you can make is a bar chart for showing a quantity by category, either the number of people in a group, or an average for that group. And this is really easy to do in Google Sheets. Here I have a table that shows the frequencies for a number of social media followers in each platform. And all I have to do is select one of these cells, I got it up here in the top, and I come over to insert chart. And Google Sheets is smart enough to know that I want a bar chart by default. Now you can see here if I click on suggested, it gives me a few choices. But this is a bar chart, really quick and easy. There's a few things I would want to do to modify this first, I'm actually going to move it over a little bit. So it's not overlapping with my data. Instead of saying count versus social media followers, I'm going to change the title, I just clicked on that. And I'm going to put by platform. I'm going to get rid of this legend here because it doesn't tell me anything useful. So I click on that double click. And then I put none. I'm going to change this word over here from count to followers. And then I don't think I need this here on the bottom. So I'm just going to select that and then delete it. And then finally, I think I'm going to change the color of the bars. So I'm going to double click on the bars, pick a different color. I personally like this red. And so there's an excellent bar chart. Now I will mention one funny thing. Technically, this isn't a bar chart, it's a column chart because it's vertical. A bar chart goes sideways. And so let's take a quick look at how we can make it a bar chart. I'm going to copy this chart. And then paste it. And then I'll drag this down a little. So I can put it underneath, I'll scroll up now. And all I need to do is double click on this chart, and then come over and tell it I no longer want a column chart, I want a bar chart. Now I'm going to have to clean things up, it went back to the default title. So I'm going to change that again to by platform. And I'm going to delete this again. And I need to clean this up again. But the reason this is a good chart, the sideways bar chart is because if you have long labels, now the words Facebook, Twitter and Instagram are not long. But if they were longer, then this makes it easier to read them because you don't have to turn your head sideways or something. And it puts it in the same orientation as the bar itself. So it's easier to follow through with it in a logical manner. Anyhow, this is the simplest chart you can make a bar chart, a column chart, and truthfully, 90% of the time, it's going to give you all the information you need to make the conclusions based on your data. 
The single most useful chart that you can make is a bar chart for showing a quantity by category, either the number of people in a group or an average for that group. And this is really easy to do in Google Sheets. Here I have a table that shows the frequencies for a number of social media followers in each platform. And all I have to do is select one of these cells. I got it up here in the top and I come over to insert chart. And Google Sheets is smart enough to know that I want a bar chart by default. Now you can see here, if I click on suggested, it gives me a few choices, but this is a bar chart, really quick and easy. There's a few things I would want to do to modify this. First, I'm actually going to move it over a little bit so it's not overlapping with my data. Instead of saying count versus social media followers, I'm going to change the title. I just clicked on that and I'm going to put by platform. I'm going to get rid of this legend here because it doesn't tell me anything useful. So I click on that, double click, and then I put none. I'm going to change this word over here from count to followers. And then I don't think I need this here on the bottom. So I'm just going to select that and then delete it. And then finally, I think I'm going to change the color of the bars. So I'm going to double click on the bars, pick a different color. I personally like this red. And so there's an excellent bar chart. Now I will mention one funny thing. Technically this isn't a bar chart. It's a column chart because it's vertical. A bar chart goes sideways. And so let's take a quick look at how we can make it a bar chart. I'm going to copy this chart and then paste it. And then I'll drag this down a little so I can put it underneath. I'll scroll up now. And all I need to do is double click on this chart and then come over and tell it I no longer want a column chart. I want a bar chart. Now I'm going to have to clean things up. It went back to the default title. So I'm going to change that again to by platform. And I'm going to delete this again. And I need to clean this up again. But the reason this is a good chart, the sideways bar chart is because if you have long labels, now the words Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are not long, but if they were longer, then this makes it easier to read them because you don't have to turn your head sideways or something. And it puts it in the same orientation as the bar itself. So it's easier to follow through with it in a logical manner. Anyhow, this is the simplest chart you can make a bar chart, a column chart, and truthfully, 90% of the time, it's going to give you all the information you need to make the conclusions based on your data. If you want to look at the relationship between two different variables or two different outcomes and how they affect your results, a grouped bar chart can be a really good way to do this. So here I have the same social media followers data I have had before, but now I've labeled the data we've had previously as subscribers and I've added a new column for visitors. You might be able to tell these apart and get separate reports in your analytics software. But let's see how we can show each of these. And what's interesting is this is where Google Sheets gives us a few important alternatives. I'm just going to select this first cell here, come over to insert chart. And once again, it's nice that Google Sheets is smart enough to select the entire table of data and it gives it a good title. And what we have here is a side by side chart. Now I'm going to make just a few changes here. I'm going to put it again here by platform. And although in other examples, I've gotten rid of the legend, the legend's important in this one, because you can see that blue means subscribers and red means visitors. On the other hand, with a vertical column chart like this, where things are side by side, having the legend off to the right isn't really helpful because you've got to go back and forth to look. So I'm going to click on this. And instead of having it on the right, I'm going to put it on the bottom. And now you can see that we have the blue on the left, the red on the right, and it's the same orientation as our other data. I'm going to get rid of this because it's just taking up space and we don't need that. And now it's a little bit closer. 
And then I am going to add one other thing. We don't have an vertical axis here. I'm going to add that one vertical axis title. And I'll put followers. Okay. And so this is a basic side by side chart. And what you can get from this is that we've got a lot of subscribers in Facebook, we've got more there than any other platform. And we've got a lot of visitors on Facebook, but also Instagram and a ton on Pinterest. By the way, this is totally made up data. But you see a different pattern on LinkedIn, where it's a small number, but we have more subscribers and visitors. Again, this is made up, your situation may be completely different. But I want to show you two other ways of arranging a grouped bar chart that gives you different kinds of insight. Maybe you're not so concerned about whether a person's a visitor or a subscriber, but whether they simply come to your site and follow you at all. In that case, you can rearrange the chart by stacking the blue and the red. Here's how you would do it. I'm going to copy this chart and paste it here. I'm going to scroll, get this, drag it down a little bit, and then get it. So this is a simple copy of what we had before, but I'm going to double click on it. And this time I'm going to come to this option under data that says stacking. Right now it says none because things are right next to each other. They're not stacked at all. But if I do standard stacking, now it puts the one on top of the other. And you can still see that, you know, we've got more subscribers in Facebook than anything else. We've got a lot of visitors on Pinterest, but Overall, you can see we're getting the most visits from Pinterest, the second most from Facebook, the third most from Instagram. And so you can combine them to get a total. This can be really, really helpful. And in this case, you might actually want to put the legend back on the right because you want to have things arranged top and bottom. And so now we have visitors on top subscribers, and that might be a better way to do it. Now there's one other option. And the deal is, it's hard to compare proportions with this one, you're able to look at absolute frequencies. But maybe you want to look at percentages of visitors who are subscribers versus regular visitors. And so we have one more option with a grouped bar chart, I'm going to copy this chart, paste it in, and I will bring it down here. We'll scroll up. I'm actually going to make a couple of changes on this one. The first thing I'm going to do, bring it up just a little more, is I'm actually going to change the chart type. Now, right now it's a stacked column chart, but again, sometimes a bar chart, which is the horizontal left to right chart, might be a better choice. What I'm going to do here first is I'm going to change the kind of stacking. Instead of standard, I'm going to go to what's called 100%, where it gives us not the frequencies of the counts, but the proportions of people. And now, for instance, you see that LinkedIn becomes huge in terms of the number of subscribers. If we go back to standard for a second, you can see that there's only a small number of people visiting from LinkedIn in my artificial data. But the proportion who are subscribers is huge compared to the others. And the proportion of subscribers is very small in my Pinterest data, just 10.2%. Now I want to show you one other thing you can do, I'm going to delete this one, we don't need that at all. And I'm going to put a horizontal axis title to say, proportions of followers, because remember, 0.25 means 25%, 0.5 means 50%, and so on. I'm probably going to put the legend back on the bottom. And then I'm just going to change the colors because I can, I'm going to come in here and click on the red. And I'm going to change it to say, for instance, a gray here. And it's a little prettier to look at. But these are three variations on group bar charts, they're showing you both the platform a person's on, and they're showing you whether they're a subscriber or a visitor. And they give you different insights. One allows you to look at the absolute frequencies next to each other. The second one lets you look at the totals. And the third one lets you look at the proportions. All of them are valid. All of them give different perspectives on your data. And any of that can be used to help you plan what your next step should be in your social media campaign. 
most people, when they think of spreadsheets, they think of Microsoft Excel. And Google Sheets is very similar to Excel. A lot of the functions carry straight over, but there are some differences. Part of it's because it's actually a web sheet that gives it a lot more functionality in that respect. But some things don't operate quite the way you would think. If you want to make a bar chart and make one of the bars a different color, in Excel, all you got to do is click on that bar and manually change its color. But in Google Sheets, you have to do it differently. Say, for instance, I would have my data here on social media followers and I want to draw attention to Instagram. Well, it turns out that the way to make Instagram's bar a different color than the others is to actually make a grouped bar chart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a second column here. I'll call it highlight. And then I'm going to take Instagram's value and I'm going to move it over. So this is kind of a funny data because no platform has values in both of these columns. They're in either one or the other. But watch how this works. I come to social media followers and I click insert chart and it makes by default a grouped bar chart, but it's a really funny looking one because everything's half width. It's expecting information from each of the columns. But if we come over here to stacking and we change it to standard, then we suddenly have what we want. There's a couple of things I want to change, however, that I think are important. Number one is I want to get rid of this legend. It actually creates confusion. So we get rid of that and we need a real title. Social media followers by platform. And then I can delete this one here on the bottom by just deleting this text over here. And now we've got a simple bar chart, column chart actually, where we are able to draw attention to one particular category, Instagram, by putting its value in a different column and making a stacked bar chart. It's a funny way to have to go about it, but it still lets you get to the same goal of making a clear visualization and drawing attention to the important values. Most people, when they think of spreadsheets, they think of Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets is very similar to Excel. A lot of the functions carry straight over, but there are some differences. Part of it's because it's actually a web sheet that gives it a lot more functionality in that respect. But some things don't operate quite the way you would think. If you want to make a bar chart and make one of the bars a different color, in Excel, all you got to do is click on that bar and manually change its color. But in Google Sheets, you have to do it differently. Say, for instance, I would have my data here on social media followers and I want to draw attention to Instagram. Well, it turns out that the way to make Instagram's bar a different color than the others is to actually make a grouped bar chart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a second column here. I'll call it highlight. And then I'm going to take Instagram's value and I'm going to move it over. So this is kind of a funny data because no platform has values in both of these columns. They're in either one or the other. But watch how this works. I come to social media followers and I click insert chart and it makes by default a grouped bar chart, but it's a really funny looking one because everything's half width. It's expecting information from each of the columns. But if we come over here to stacking and we change it to standard, then we suddenly have what we want. There's a couple of things I want to change, however, that I think are important. Number one is I want to get rid of this legend. It actually creates confusion. So we get rid of that and we need a real title. Social media followers by platform. And then I can delete this one here on the bottom by just deleting this text over here. And now we've got a simple bar chart, column chart actually, where we are able to draw attention to one particular category, Instagram, by putting its value in a different column and making a stacked bar chart. It's a funny way to have to go about it, but it still lets you get to the same goal of making a clear visualization and drawing attention to the important values. When you have a quantitative or measured variable like the price of an order or the amount of time somebody spent on your website or the number of kids in a family, you want to make a histogram as a way of looking at the overall shape of the distribution. It helps you see if there's any spikes in particular places, helps you see if there's gaps and outliers. 
So let's take a look at some artificial data I have here on hypothetical orders or totals from particular clients. And we've got a bunch of rows of data here, 113. But let's just come over and click on insert chart. One of the things is Google Sheets again is smart and it's able to figure out that a histogram would be most appropriate for this. There's a few things that we need to change however. I need to click on this and get rid of the legend because it's just silly and taking up space. And what you can see is that most of the orders are down here low. It's drawing a box that goes from $0 to $1,650, next one to $3,300. By the way, the width of these boxes, the fact that it goes to 1650 then 3300 that's called the bucket width or bin width. And it's arbitrary. You can make it as small as you want, as big as you want. What Google Sheets is doing is it's using a rule of thumb that says, you know, usually somewhere around 7, 9, 11 bars is best. And so it's dividing the data up to do that. And you can see we've got one case way up here, and we've got this big gap here in the middle. This is a skewed distribution, which is actually what you expect anytime you're dealing with something like money. And we've got this one big outlier. Now, when you have an outlier like this, the first thing you want to do is see, is that data correct? And if it is correct, then you get to decide what you want to include it in. It may be, for instance, that because it's so unusual, it represents a different category, you don't want to include it with the others. But let me show you a couple of things you can do to help clean up a histogram to help decide what's going on with your data. I'm going to double click on this. And well, since it brought me to this one, I'm just going to change the color because I prefer that color. But let me come back up to histogram. You can change the bucket size. Now, it's doing buckets at $1,650 each, which I think is silly. So I'm going to manually change them to $1,000 each. And while it does introduce a lot more empty space here, it's easier to read them. I'm going to change these values here and not have them slanted. Slanted is really hard to read. I'm just going to make them straight up vertical. At least it's easier to tell what's going on there. And so this is one way of looking at it. We still have this big outlier. We've got this huge gap, but it lets us know where most of our cases are. Now, Google Sheets does give you one option for dealing with outliers. Of course, you could just exclude it from the data, say this is not representative of the group that we want to deal with, or you could use a different kind of analysis. But there is one option. So I'm going to double click on this, come to the histogram, and it's this one right here. It's outlier percentile. And what this does is it takes the highest certain percent of cases and it brings them down and puts them in the next lowest bar. So watch what happens when I do this. Right now we've got this one case up here, we've got this huge gap, and then the next highest is at 5,000. So if I click this 1%, boom, it brings it way down. Now, what it's also done, unfortunately, is it's changed the way it draws the bins and labels them, and it gives them these really weird, arbitrary cutoff points. And unfortunately, there's really not much you can do about that. You know, you can try going down to horizontal axis and manually setting the values to zero, but once you've done the binning thing, it, it, it doesn't have any effect. But it still lets you see the picture. Say, yeah, most of our cases are down here. Then we got this, we've got this little gap here. Then we got a couple of cases that are higher. You could do a higher percentage if you wanted. You could do, for instance, 5%. And you see it changes a little bit more. But you're never going to get rid of these weird bins down here. So the only way to get rid of those, by the way, is to just back up and do the undo and undo and undo. And now you're back to where you were originally. But the important thing here is that Google Sheets is able to draw a histogram by default. You're able to see that most of your order totals are in the 1,000 or 2,000 range. And then you got this really huge gap with this one extremely high total up here, more than three times as high as anybody else. But this is the purpose of a histogram to help you find these generalities where most of the orders are and the outliers exceptions. And so this gives you a good start on trying to make sense of your orders and what you want to do next in your business. One of the most important things you can look at in an organization is change over time. That might be the number of customers you have, the number of people you reach, the amount of money you bring in. There's a lot of different things. And 
one of the best ways of looking at that is with a line graph where you have time across the bottom and the quantity that you're looking at measured vertically. Now I'm going to show you how to do both a single line graph and a multiple line graph. What I have here is some made up data of revenue from several different sources for a nonprofit organization. So we have donations, we have events that they run, for, say for instance, ticket sales, we have grants that they receive from private or government organizations, and the total amount of revenue for each month. And I've only got it for about a year and a half here. But this is enough to show us how these kinds of graphs work and the value you can get out of them. I'm going to start by doing just donations, although I do have to select month also because that's what goes across the bottom. So I'm selecting these two columns. And I come over and I hit insert chart. And it does a line graph by default. And so you can see that things are kind of flat here at the beginning, then there's a big jump. And by the way, if you just hover over, it can tell you what the actual values are at each point. But there's a few things that would be important to modify in this graph. First off, is I'm going to put not donations versus month, that makes it sound like there's an opposition, but donations by month. And then we don't need this legend over here, because there's only one line it doesn't tell us anything useful. So I'm going to hit none. And then I'm going to make a couple of other modifications to this chart. One is I, I don't like, you know, the jagged line. So I'm going to change its color. I'm going to change its thickness, I find a thicker line is often easier to deal with four points seems to work well. And then I'm going to put points on to indicate the actual values, the observations. So you see now we have a point at each place. That's helpful. Another thing you can do is I'm going to scroll back up to the top here to chart style is I have an option to smooth the line, because right now it goes straight, bend, straight, bend, and it's I think that the jagged parts draw too much attention to themselves. So by smoothing it out, we make it curved and it's a little easier to see the pattern over time. Now, just as a note, there is a separate smooth line chart as a type so you can choose that if you want. But since I was just using the automatic insert chart, customizing it seemed like a good way to go. The next thing I want to fix is this over here. We've got 5000 10,000 15,000. And it's easy to read but the thousands parts takes up more space than I want. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to come here to the vertical axis to the scale factor. And when I hit 1000, it divides all of these numbers by 1000. But I need to make sure that we don't think people are receiving just $10 in donations. So I'm going to modify this vertical axis title. And then in parentheses, I'll put thousands. And then there's one more thing I want to do here. And that is, right down at the bottom, it's giving me some of the months and you know, maybe that's okay. But personally, I'd like to see all of them. And so all I have to do is click on that and come to this one under horizontal axis and say treat labels as text. And when I do that, it shows all of them. On the other hand, it also slants them, which is hard to read. So I'm going to change that to 90 degrees. And then I don't think we need this title here anymore for the axis because it's explanatory what it is. And so there is a very clear line chart that shows the variations in donations by month from October of 2016 through February of 2018. It's really easy to see the changes. You want to see what happened between here and here to cause this big spike, what happened to get it all the way up to this maximum and why did it fall so quickly. And so those are some of the issues that you're going to want to look at. But fortunately, this is what the purpose of this visualization is, is to bring these things to your attention so you can investigate it. Now, I showed you at the beginning, there's more than one source of revenue for this organization. There's not just donations, there's also events, there's grants, and there's a total. We can get all of those into one chart. I'll show you how that works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this chart. So now I'm going to take this new chart, I'm going to drag it down and move things up, but not all the way I want to keep a little bit of the data showing over here, because I need to change the data that I'm using. So I'm going to click on this and do edit chart, then I'm going to hit data range. 
Now when I do that, I can simply come over to the data. And if I do shift command space on a Mac or shift control space on a PC, it selects the entire block of data. I hit that and voila, there's all my data. Now I'm going to come up and I'm going to make some changes to this. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select all series and I'm going to do all of them four pixels thick and all of them with seven pixel dots. Now, because I changed this red one manually, that means this darker orange one sort of conflicts. And so I need to change its color. So I'm going to come here to the darker orange one, which is events. And I'm going to change it to a blue. Great. So now we can tell them apart a little better. Now there's a couple of other things I need to do because I changed the nature of the data. Number one is I need to change the title here because this is no longer just donations. I need to put revenue by source by month. And then here on the side, I need to change donations to revenue. There we go. And there's one other thing. Because I have several different lines, you need to know which is which. And so I need to put the legend back in. So I'm going to put legend, and then I'm going to put it on the well, let's see how it looks on the right, there's on the right. And there is on the bottom. I actually think that maybe in this case, the one on the bottom looks a little bit better because we get a little more linearity in the chart that we have going across. In any case, this is a way of looking at the change over time of several different values. And it lets you see how the multiple sources contribute to a total and gives you a better picture, in this case, of the financial health of your organization. If you want to show changes over time, you do have the option of doing the basic line chart, which I've showed elsewhere. But Google Sheets also gives you a specialized timeline, which is designed for things that have months or years on the bottom, and a change in a quantity, often financial, over time. I'm going to use the same data here, and I'm going to show you how to make this specialized timeline. I'll start with just the first two columns, month and donations. And when I click on the insert chart, it's going to give us the default timeline, which we've had before. But I'm going to come here to chart type, and I'm going to click that and go way down to the bottom where we have the timeline chart. And when I click on that, it's a different kind of thing. It actually gives you some interactive functionality. Now I'm going to do a couple of things first just to clean it up and come here to customize. And I'm going to change the line thickness from one to four. So the lines thicker, and I'm going to give it fill opacity, just 10%, which fills in the area beneath it. And it makes it a little easier to see what's going on. There's one other important thing, you'll see that these values here go from 5000 to 10,000 to 15,000. But they don't start at zero. And in my mind, they should always start at zero. So I'm going to click on this box, expand range to show zero. And now we're set. That's as many options as I have for this. But what I want to show you is that when you come over it, you see, as I go over a particular value, it will highlight that value and give us the date and the amount. You can control it two different ways. Number one is you can come down here and you can drag this box to set your own time range. That's, you know, that's the whole point of having the timeline. Or you can use these zoom buttons. You can say, go back to the max, show me the last year, show me the last six months. If you've ever worked with financial data on the web, you often have these same options. Now, this is a simple timeline with just one variable being displayed, we can do more than that. In fact, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to copy this chart. And then let me drag that new copied chart down. It's not overlapping. And what I'm going to do in this chart is I'm going to change the data that it uses. And I'm going to give it all of the data. I'm going to come back up here. I just click in here and do the shift control or command and spacebar. That selects the data. And now I've got all of it there. And there's really nothing else I need to do because it maintains all the same options that I already set. But you know, we can still do the interactive thing. We can 
click right here we can come back a little bit and as I come in you see how it says donations events grants and total up here at the top as I come into the chart it'll give us the actual values of each of those as we scroll through and so that is a great way to explore the data and to see what's happening there as well and so the timeline chart while it has fewer options overall gives you some very specific functions that are hard to assemble on your own but give you the ability to explore your data in more detail. Changes in spreadsheet graphics may come slowly, but they do come. And one of the more interesting developments in data visualization in spreadsheets, and especially in Google Sheets, is something called a sparkline. Now, this is a concept that derives from work by Edward Tufte, really father of modern data visualization. But the idea here is to create a very small graphic that fits in line with text. And in the case of a spreadsheet, it means it fits right in a cell. What I'm going to show you is how to make these in cell visualizations for several different kinds of data because the sparkline function in Google Sheets is pretty flexible. Now, this is a formula. So I type equals and then I start typing in sparkline. And you can see it says it's going to give me a miniature chart within a single cell. I just need to tell it what data. I, so I highlight this data. And then I close the parenthesis. And then there it is. I now have a timeline chart. It's really small. I'll make it bigger for right now. Let's scroll down a little. And so now I've got this little timeline chart that shows the variation in donations over time. It sets it so that the lowest values at the bottom, the highest values here at the top, and it just moves over one step at a time. It doesn't indicate months, it's just going from this cell to this cell to this cell. But here's a neat thing, because it's a formula, I can do what I do with other formulas and I can drag it to apply to other columns. And so now I've got this little timeline for each one of them. This is really a marvelous thing when you've got a bunch of different data sources, you wanna look at them really quickly. Also, because they're in each cell, you know, I can just make the cell bigger if I want to, and now the charts are bigger. Also, you have the option of changing some of the properties of each sparkline. So for instance, this one right here, it looks like it goes from really low to really high. But if you scroll through the data, you see that it actually goes from 12,000 to 20,000. And so it's a little misleading to have it start that low. We can change where it starts by fixing a parameter called Y min. So I'm going to double click on this. I'm going to come right here. And I'm going to paste in a comma and then in curly brackets, because that's how you do arguments in Google Sheets for spark lines. I put in quotes, Y min, that's the thing I want to change, comma, and then the value I want it to have. I enter, and now you can see it's bumped up so that it's a little over halfway up. That's a big improvement over what we had. You can change other things as well. You can change, for instance, the color and the line thickness, which I'll do with this one. This is our total, so it should appear a little bit differently. I'm going to put in there two arguments. One, I'm going to change the color. And this is a hex code. It's a way of specifying colors as frequently used with computers. This is the dark red that I've been using in lots of other things. Then I put a semicolon because I'm going to include a second argument. And that is line width, and two means two pixels. And now I've got a total chart which is a, stands apart from the others, but also lets us see the change in time. And so this is a really handy way to look at data and the flexibility of being able to do it in a cell is a fabulous thing. Now I'm gonna come over, I'm gonna put this back down for a moment to 100%. I'm gonna come over to this next column. This is called win-loss. Now you may not be doing this in your data. This originally comes from sports about whether a team won a game or lost a game. And I'm putting in some zeros to indicate that they didn't play or there was a rain out or something like that. You can adapt this to other things like, for instance, whether you got a new client, whether you lost a client, I don't know, whatever works well for you. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put in another spark line. So I'm just going to go a spark line. Then I'm going to select the data. Now, if I just do this by default, it'll draw the same kind of line graph that I have over on the others. And that might be helpful. But with win loss data, there's a special kind of sparkline. So I'm going to open up that one. And I'm going to insert this extra information. 
where I say chart type is win loss, all one word here. And when I do that, it gives me this little collection of bars on the top half and on the bottom half. Let me zoom in on those. I'll go back to 200. Scroll over a little bit, come down here. And so you can see that we start with two wins, we got a couple of rain outs and then a loss of win, a few losses. And it's a way of seeing this pattern of a dichotomous variable over time. You can do things like you can put different colors for the tops and for the bottom, you can put a line through the middle. You can, there's a lot of options for coloring this, but this is the default win loss chart. Now I want to come and finish with one other one. I'm going to back this down to maybe 150. And that is the social media follower data that I've used before. I did this with a repeat chart, which allowed me to draw just vertical bars using a formula all the way across. There is a way to do this with spark lines, but it takes a little bit of adaptation. So let me do this, I'll enter spark line. And then I'll tell it the thing I'm going to draw is this. I'm going to close the parenthesis. Now I'm going to get an error message. And the reason I'm going to get an error is because it says it, you need at least two data points, and I only gave it one but I'm doing a different kind of data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on this. And then right here, I'm going to insert that I'm doing a bar chart. So I put comma and then in curly brackets, chart type comma bar. And when I do that, it draws a bar that fills up the whole cell. That's actually kind of neat. And I can drag it down. But you'll see there's another problem here. It just automatically assumes that each bar should go to the maximum. So right now it's not telling us anything. What I have to do is I have to change the maximum on each of these so that it, each one of these bars has as its maximum the maximum value here in our count, which is this 50. So I'm going to double click on this one. I'm going to come right here and I'm going to insert another argument. And now what I'm putting is max is equal to the maximum of this range of data. And I have to use the dollar sign two and dollar sign seven so that it always stays row two to row seven as I drag the formula down. Now the first bar is not going to look any different. But as I drag it down, now you see that all the other ones adjust, and they show you what proportion they are of the maximum score of 50. And so spark lines are a really creative and new way of visualizing several different kinds of data, changes over time, wins and losses over time, even simple bar charts, but all done within cells, which allow you to rearrange them in a number of ways. They've got a lot of other options. You can explore some of those, but this is a really a fun development in data visualization in Google Sheets. Wouldn't you like to be able to predict the future or at least try to guess how things are going to happen very soon? One way to do this is with using scatter plots and associations between two quantitative or scaled variables. In this example, I'm looking at the number of sales in quarter one and the number of sales in quarter two. These are totally made up numbers. But I want to show you how to build a scatter plot and get some predictive value out of it. Now, when I take these data, and I just click on insert chart, by default, it gives me the two line charts, which is definitely not what I want. I want to see how they connect one with another. So I click here on chart type. And one of the suggested charts is a scatter plot. And this lets you see the connection between sales in quarter one and sales in quarter two. So for instance, we got one quarter here that was really low in quarter one. It's about a 90, but super high in quarter two. So things went better. A lot of the others, it was just kind of uniform that quarter two seemed to be pretty consistent. Now I do want to show you a couple of ways to modify these charts that might make it work better for your presentations. The first of these is that I'm going to come in and I'm going to change just for instance, the colors, I'm going to change it to red. And then I'm going to take this option right here and add a trend line. What this is, is a straight line that goes through the data that summarizes the relationship between the two. And because we've got this really unusual score over here that's super low on x and super high on y, we end up with a downhill pattern overall. I can make that a little thicker if I want I'll make it to four point. And um, you can change the color and the opacity. But I'm going to do one other thing here, it's going to say show r squared. Now, 
this is a little more than I really want to do when I'm talking about visualization because this is getting into actual data analysis. But this is a statistical measure of the strength of association between two variables. It goes from zero to one and you read it like a proportion. So the fact that this one says trend line for sales and it says R squared equals 0.091, that tells you that 9% of the variance in quarter two sales can be accounted for by the variance in quarter one sales. It's a technical thing, but it lets you know there's an association there, but it's small. I'm going to do one other thing and then call it quits on this. I'm going to come back to this trend line, but I'm going to go to series because what I want to do is I want, simply want to change the title for this. It gives custom label trend line for Q2 sales. I'm just going to remove that. So we just have the R squared there. And then that is a good final chart for looking at the association between two variables. If you're familiar with scatter plots and if you understand how regression works, then this is the best way to look at the association between two quantitative variables. You can re repeat it for lots of different possible associations to find the variables. They're going to give you the best predictive insight into what's happening in your organization. If you want to draw a scatter plot to show the association between two quantitative variables, but you want to draw attention to one of the observations, you want to, for instance, change its color. Again, in other programs, this might be easy to do. Just click on the dot, change it. But in Google Sheets, as we saw with bar charts, if you want to change a bar, you got to do it in kind of a funny way. The way it works here is, again, we create a new column for the one data point that we want to highlight. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have our Q1 and Q2 sales. And let's say that we have a new channel, a new method of making sales, and we want to highlight that one. I'm going to come down here to this 116 because I know this is an unusual score. I'm going to cut it out of there and paste it over here. And now you see we've got this one value sitting in this column all by itself. Let me highlight all of this data. Just doing the shift command or control in the space bar and then come over to insert chart. Now what it does is it gives me these three bar charts, which is definitely not what I want. I'm going to come down to scatter plot. And now when I move this over, you can see that the one unusual value is here all by itself way up high. And that accentuates it so we can see that something else is going on with this particular data set. Now another option I have here is to draw a trend line. And it does the trend line for the collection of the data. And you can see that, you know, it's really kind of flat all the way through. And that highlights that it's really consistent from Q1 to Q2, except for this one special new channel that has been massively productive in getting us sales in the second quarter. So again, it's a little bit of a hack, but if you want to highlight the one of them in Google Sheets, you're going to need to put that value into a separate column. You only need to put one of the values for it into a separate column, and that will allow you to put it in a different color and draw attention to it. An important thing to remember about Google Sheets is that it's made by Google. And so it's not just a software company. This is a very serious tech company with very high end machine learning and even artificial intelligence. And they have found ways to bring this into Google Sheets. And so I thought I'd end this chapter by doing something that kind of pulls the rug out from under a lot of the other work I did by showing you the automatic graphs you can get from a new feature in Google Sheets called Explore. If you look way down in the bottom right, you will see a green button here that says Explore. And it shows up in several different programs. It'll show up in Docs, it'll show up in Slides, but here in Sheets, it does something in particular. I'm gonna click on Explore. You can also do the Option Shift X. And it brings up this window on the right, and it allows you to ask, for instance, like, What's the correlation between events and donations? These two different sources. And look, it'll give you a scatter plot. It'll even give you a formula. And you can get this information, a lot of these directly from right here. You can format the document if you want to do it in shades of green. Look, now it'll do it for you. That's quick and easy. But the important one is down here with analysis. It starts producing a series of charts. And some of these we've made on our own. Let's say, for instance, this one right here. 
the idea is it makes a chart. It even gives you a little bit of interpretation. For every year, donations increases by about $10,300. That's fabulous. Now, you can also click on this button if you want to see it larger. It fills it up right there. I'll hit escape and go back. Or you can even add it to make it a part of your spreadsheet. I'll just click this plus button. And now it's there in our spreadsheet. I'm going to drag it over a little bit. And then I can come back. I'll get out of that one. I'll come back to Explore and see what some of the other charts are. We've got a line graph. It talks about donations increasing. We've got this little stacked bar graph. December 2017 has the highest value for donations and a value greater than most for events. And if we come back up to the top, you see we can even click on more. It'll do, you know, more of this. And so we come back down here and then we've got scatter plots and bar charts and donations went down in uh, 2016 October. We get a pie chart. It's, it's really kind of amazing. And this is the sort of thing that as Google continues to work on their products, which they spend a lot of time on, there will be more and more functionality here. And so truthfully, when you start working with your data, you may want to go, instead of waiting for the end, go at the beginning to see what Explore offers you, both in terms of pre-made charts and even some suggestions on the interpretation. It might save you some time and give you additional insights that you might not have approached through your own means. And so it's a fabulous, fabulous addition to Google Sheets to help make your analysis and your applications easier. When you've made all of your charts in Google Sheets, you've got a lot of different ways that you can get that information out there. You can share the individual sheets with people. You can save the charts as images and put them into presentations or documents. You can copy them and put them onto websites. But I do want to show you one interesting alternative that works well because Google Sheets is in fact a web application, and that is publishing your charts to the web. Now, I'm going to begin with one that isn't even really a chart. It's this page right here. We just want to publish this little bit of text-based charts. And so let's do this. Let's just come right up here to File and to Publish to the Web. Now, what it's going to ask is whether I want to do the entire document or just this one page or a particular page. And what these are actually listing are graphs on pages. I'm just going to pick this first page. And it's going to ask whether I want to do it as a web page or save it as a CSV or tab separated file or a PDF or something else. I'm going to save it as a web page. And I'm going to hit publish. It double checks, which is a good thing. And then it gives me this very, very long web address. Now, I'm going to go to a incognito browser so it's not logged in for me. And I enter that and go to it and check it out. There is my chart. It's my little repeat chart. And so, it, you know, it's not well formatted, but the point is it's there and it's a way of getting the stuff out immediately. Let's try a different one. I'm going to go back to where I was. I'm going to close this one. And let's come down here to the line chart. And I'm going to come down to this bottom one because I've got several different lines on it. So this might be the sort of thing that you want to share with other people. I'm going to hit these three buttons right here. And that also gets me to the publish chart. I could do it from the file menu as well. I'm going to hit publish chart, revenue by source by month. And I have an option of making it interactive or making it a static image. I'm going to do this one as an image. And by the way, you can see down here, it's telling me that the repeat chart is published also. I'm going to hit publish. It's going to check with me again. That's good. And I'm going to copy this address. And I'll go back to this page, open up a new tab, paste it in. And now you can see it's a web page. It's up here on docs.google.com. And it's a little fuzzy because it actually is low resolution. It's about 500 by 300 pixels. I don't know why it's that small, but it's available to people and people can copy this URL and have access to the document. Now I want to go a third choice. And that is let's come over to the timeline because I've got this same data about revenue sources, revenue streams. And I'm going to take this more complex one. Now, 
One of the cool things about timelines is that they are by nature interactive. You can come here and say, I want just the last one year, I want the last six months. Of course, it's going to bring up this editing window, so I'll slide things over. And you've got this little slider right here you can use as a way of changing the uh, time frame you're dealing with. That's all very cool. So let's come up to these three little dots and say, publish the chart. Now the last one I did as an image, this one I'm going to make interactive. So I'm going to hit publish. It's going to ask me if I want to do that. I'm going to copy that address so it's already highlighted. Go to my other page, open a new tab and put the address in there. And what you'll find is it actually doesn't look exactly the way it was before. It's arranged a little differently. So for instance, these three sources are lift listed on the left as opposed to across the top. But you do get the numbers as you go through and you do have the zoom thing. This is still available, but we've lost the thing to drag across the bottom, the timeline selector, which is unfortunate because that's one of the best ways of interacting. So not perfect, not complete, but it is a really nice way to share things by just giving people a web page, give them a link and they can start interacting with your data in certain ways and start getting some of the same insights out of it that you had. Now I want to finish with one little thing here. I'm going to close these three tabs. And that is once you have stuff published, you know, the time may come and you don't want it to be out there anymore. And so what you need to do is come down here. This is showing us what's published. Uh, we can't scroll up very much here. But you see the check marks next to the things that are published. Just hit stop publishing. And those links will no longer be active and this stuff is back in your private control. So publishing is one interesting, not perfect, but an interesting method of getting your information out there, sharing your message, sharing your data, and then being able to get insight from the people around you. When people think about computers and data, a lot of times they think about things like machine learning and these artificial intelligence algorithms that do these incredibly complicated things. But it turns out that the vast majority of tasks that we need to do with data are simple arithmetic, addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. And these are really easy to do in Google Sheets with formulas. But one thing we need to get started with is cell references. So when you're writing a formula, you need to have Google Sheets refer to the right cell. And you can do this with what are either called relative references or absolute references. And I'll demonstrate both. We'll begin with relative references. What I have here is a list of the numbers one through 10. And I want to take each of those numbers and I want to multiply it times two. And I'm going to start by writing a formula. All I do is I type equals that tells Google Sheets I'm going to write a formula. And then I click on the cell I want to multiply. It's one over to the left. And I to multiply it times two, I do asterisk two. Great. And when I do that, you can see a preview of what these answers are going to be. I just hit it. And there's a two. If you want to see again, what's going on here, just double click on this cell. And it will highlight the cell it's referring to. And you see the color here is orange and it matches here. If you have more than one cell reference, it'll do them in different colors. But you can see that there's a formula there. And then I'm going to click on that one and I'm going to drag it down. And what it's going to do is it's going to maintain the relative reference and it's going to say at each step, take the cell that is one over to the left and multiply it times two. If you want to see what all the formulas look like, you can do control tilde where the tilde on the US keyboard is above the tab. And that shows you all the formulas and you see it goes to a three to a four to a five, so on down to a 12. And multiply times 12. That's a relative reference because all it says is go one to the left. It doesn't say go to column a, although it has an a written here, but it just is interpreted as the next one to the left. Now there's other ways to do it. You don't have to refer just to the left. Let me turn off the view formulas. You may want to do a running total, in which case we do a combination of things. First, I'm going to write a formula that says, copy this one right here. That's the simplest possible formula. And then for each subsequent formula, I'm going to say, take the number that's right above and to that add the number that's to the left. Okay, so one above and add one to the left. 
And if I take that and drag it down, you'll see that in each point, it's taking the number that's immediately above and the number that's immediately to the left and adding them up. And I get a running total of, by the time I get to the bottom here, 110. That actually is a useful thing to do if you are keeping track, say, for instance, of invoices and you need to know the total expenditures, doing this running total is actually how you would do it. And relative references will be useful for that one. On the other hand, sometimes you say, don't just go one to the left or one above, but you need to tell it to refer to a specific column or a specific row, even when you're moving things around. That's where you get the idea of an absolute reference. Now, I'm going to multiply numbers in this little table, and I'll show you really how not to do it. We'll start by saying, I'm going to type in equals to say it's a formula. We'll take one to the left, and I'll type an asterisk to multiply, and I'll do it one to the top. Okay, one times two is easy, but watch what happens. If I drag that down, it's not going to do five times two here. It's doing five times six, and if I drag that all to the right, then I end up with some really big numbers instead of this should be 30 down here instead of 3 million. And so that's not what we want to do. I'm going to back that up. Instead, I need to tell it that when it goes to the left, it needs to always go to column E. And when it goes to the top, it needs to always go to row two. But even though it always goes to column E, it will sometimes need to go to this number or this number or this number, depending on the row it's in. So we're going to do a combination of relative and absolute references. And the way to tell it to always go to one particular column or one particular row is to use a dollar sign on the US keyboard that's above the four. And that says always go to E, although it can adjust the row. And over here, it says you can adjust the column, but always go to row number two. And when I do that, watch what happens. I can drag that. And now it works the way I want to. So if I click on this one, you can see it's multiplying that number and that number. If I click on this one, it's doing that number and that number. And if I do this cell, it's going the six times five, which is 30. And so that's one way to do it now. By the way, there is a more sophisticated way of using something called an array formula here, but that's a special circumstance and I'm, I'm not going to get into that. And there's one other situation where you may want to use absolute references on both dimensions. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recreate this table here by simply saying equals. Then I'll come up here and I'm going to copy all those values. These are relative references, by the way. And there we go. So I've got them all there, but I want to multiply each of these numbers times 10, which means it always has to go to exactly this cell, which is E8. And so what I need to do is I click on this formula here and I write an asterisk to do multiplication. I'm going to click on this cell E8, but then I'm going to put a dollar sign before the E and a dollar sign before the eight. And then when I drag it down, it will always refer to that specific cell when doing the multiplication. So for instance, if I click right here, you can see it's taking that number, multiplying it times that. Here, it's doing the relative reference up to here, but the absolute reference to this cell, and the same thing here, relative reference to this one, but always referring to this one back. And so that's the combination of absolute and relative references. The way that you combine them gives you more flexibility in how you create your formulas and more power in how you set up your analyses. Some of the most useful things you can do in a spreadsheet are also the most basic. And so I want to show you some of the most important formulas that you'll use most often to get the first steps of insight out of your data. The three that I want to show you with one variation on them are count and sum and mean. A count is used to simply decide how many values you have in front of you. It's getting your sample size. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this series of dates here, and I've imagined like we have a yoga studio, and we've got the number of people attending a group class on each day. Now, please note, one of these is not a number, it's text. I wrote down because the 4th of July is a holiday in the US. But let's do this first one, which is count. Now, I can do this two different ways. I can type equals and then the word count. But because this is one of the basic formulas, there's a shortcut to it. 
If I come right up here, this is a Greek sigma, that's the summation sign. If I simply say count, it inserts equals count and then the parentheses and it simply wants to know what data should it count. And I'm going to drag, click and drag over these numbers. And when I hit return, I get 13. So there are 13 numbers here. The thing to remember about count is it only counts how many numbers there are. So it ignored this piece of text. On the other hand, there may be situations where you need to include even written things, you need to include any kind of information that's in a cell. And in that case, you're going to want to use a small variation called count a. You can think of count a as count all not just numbers, but everything. And this one I am going to type out, I'm going to put equals. And then I'm going to type in count a. And that pops up right there. So I can click on that. And then I'm going to click and drag over the data. And then I'm going to put a closing parenthesis and hit return. And that tells us that there are 14 values within this range of data. There are 13 numbers within that range. But there are 14 values 14 cells that have something in them. So counting can be very important just for counting how many entries you have. Even more useful is going to be adding things up sum, and summing's really easy to do. I'm going to put my cursor right here, select that cell, then I'm going to come back up and hit sum. And it simply wants to know what data to add up. So I'm going to click and drag over these. And I have a sum of 170. So over 14 days, we had 13 classes at the yoga studio, and we had a total of 170 people show up, which raises the next question. If we had 170 people show up over 13 classes, what's the average number of people per class? Now there's two ways to do this. One is to simply take this sum and divide it by the count. That is the definition of a mean. But I can also use the built in formula for mean, which is nice because it's going to ignore, for instance, that piece of text in there as well. So I'm simply going to have this cell come over here and click average. The average and the mean in most situations refer to the same thing. It's where you get a total of the number of people, or the amount of money, or the amount of time, and you divide it by the number of cases you're distributing it across. I'm going to hit average and then simply drag over these numbers, hit return. And that tells me that I have an average of 13.1 people in each class period. Now, obviously, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, we go from seven to 21. But an average of 13. And so these are very simple operations, simply counting how many numbers you have, adding them up and getting the average. But you're also going to find those are going to give you an enormous amount of insight. The simple operations are most often the most effective in getting meaning out of your data. And these simple arithmetic procedures are very simple to do with the built in functions in Google Sheets. More than anything, a spreadsheet like Google Sheets is a container for data. And one of the important things to remember is that data comes in lots of different forms. A lot of it's numerically based, but even then you can format it in many different ways. And there is also non numeric data and Google Sheets can handle a huge amount of this. And I want to show you some of those variations. So you know what you can put in and adapt to your own purposes. The most obvious one, of course, is just plain old numbers, like this integer 1587. You put those in there, Google Sheets will usually put them flush right text is usually flush left. You can type those in, you can get a lot out of just those kinds of counting numbers. On the other hand, you can also get proportions which are read like percentages. So this is 0 0.87 is the same as 87%. In fact, if you want to see it as a percentage, you can just take that proportion and you can click here on the format as percent key. And there it is. It even gives you two decimal places, but it's obviously 87%. You also have the option of just typing it in as 87%. I'll do it like this. And that also works as a percent. If I press the percent sign there, now you see how it works. 
Now, there's one thing you don't want to do, and that is type in a number 87, and then think if you do this, it's going to turn it into 87%. It turns it into 8,700%, which is obviously not what you want. So you need to start with a proportion, the 0.87, and it turns it into percentages. You can also put in the number like pi, and you can decrease the decimals, which is good because pi has infinite decimals, so we can make it a little smaller if you want. Or if you have a number with a lot of decimals already entered, and I'm using the pi function here, you can increase the decimals. I don't know that you really need a lot more, but they're available if you want them. Now, often the information you're going to be entering into a spreadsheet is going to be financial. You're going to have money. You're going to be keeping track of purchases and payments. And you have several different options. One is the accounting format. So if you're an accountant, you're familiar with this. But you come up to format to number and then come down here to accounting. And what it does is it puts the comma in for the thousands. It puts the dollar sign way over here. Okay, that's pretty easy. You can also do financial formatting, which is similar in certain ways. I'll come down here and you'll see it puts in the comma, but otherwise it doesn't have the dollar sign in it. Formats a little bit differently. And there's also currency. And you can set your local currency in Google Sheets. I'm going to use dollars. That's where I am. And so you can see now it puts a little bit differently. And it's three different ways of representing the same information. Now, I realize they're slightly different from each other. It becomes a little more pronounced when you make the numbers negative. So I'm going to put a negative there. And now you see it puts it in parentheses. That's a common thing in accounting. And with financial, it also puts it in parentheses. But when I come to currency, and I put a negative, it sticks it in front of the dollar sign. So a few different ways of dealing with money, depending on what's the most common practice in the work that you do. You can also put in dates, you just type them in 7 slash 16, it'll format them. And then I'll show you in another video, there's a lot you can do with dates in Google Sheets. And you can also use time. So for instance, 10, 10, 31, just enter it as hours and then colon, minutes, colon, and seconds. So those are all numbers and there's a lot of things you can do with numbers, but Google Sheets is able to handle a lot more than that. It's able to handle, well, for instance, it can handle text. So you can just type in words and it turns out there's a lot of functions that allow you to deal with words. And I'll give you examples of those in a later movie. You can put in web links. If you type in a valid web address, I just typed in datalab.cc, my address, it recognizes that as HTTP, although it should be HTTPS because I have an SSL certificate. And those are live links. You can click on them and it'll take you there. So here, for instance, I have my website, Data Lab, now opening because I had it here in the cell. The same thing works. You can put email addresses in there. It'll work a lot of different ways. You can put web data. This is an interesting one. This is a special function that calls in Google Finance data. So this is today's stock price for Google. $1,066 a share. And by the way, notice we get this little uh, disclaimer down here at the bottom. If I were to delete that, the disclaimer would go away. Of course, you can use formulas, and I've used a few of them already. I can have a lot more say about formulas. So for instance, the formula that pulls up this data is Google Finance, and then in parentheses and uh, quotation marks, Goog, because that's the uh, symbol for Google and financial markets. And one other interesting thing you can do in Google Sheets that you can't do in every spreadsheet is you can include images. Now, this is an image that is on the web. It's, it's my company logo. And you do image and then you put the URL for that image in quotes. Nice thing is if I make this cell bigger, that you know it increases in size as well. So you can put an image in a cell if you can link it from a URL. I'm going to put that one back to where it was. And then finally, you have the option of including floating images and a number of other things. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to come right here to insert. You can put in a chart, an image, a drawing, a form, check boxes, comments, and I'll talk about a lot of those. Let me just insert an image for right now. 
The one thing you need to know when you include an image, I'm just going to get one off of my desktop. I got my data lab icon. The one thing you need to know is that it's a floating image. And so it's not in the cell. You can drag it around. It's also really big. I'm going to make it smaller. So it's not linked to the cell. And that's a little different from this web image that we have in the cell. But it is possible to include this information, especially if you're trying to build up a repository or even have a sort of a branding with your uh, spreadsheets. It gives you many different options. And so what you can see from all of this is that Google Sheets is able to serve as a container for a lot of different kinds of data, each of which might arise in different circumstances in your own work. Numbers are probably what come to mind for most people when they think about spreadsheets. And that's reasonable because I'm willing to bet that most spreadsheets are, in fact, filled with numbers. But spreadsheets are more powerful than that and more flexible. They can use text as well, which is good because when you're working in an organizational setting, chances are you're going to have to work with a lot of text, like people's names and their addresses and what their last orders were. And the nice thing is you can work with that. I want to show you a few specific functions that can be very helpful, in particular dealing with names in Google Sheets. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you these using the name Ruth St. Dennis. Now, if you don't know Ruth St. Dennis, she's one of the founders of American Modern Dance. And even though her name looks like it should be pronounced Ruth St. Denis, she's American, so it's St. Dennis. The first thing we want to do is simply find out how many characters there are in a cell. And that's a really simple one because we have a function called len for length. And it counts the number of letters and spaces and punctuation. So we have 14 pieces of information in this particular cell. Great. That's a starting point for a lot of other things. Now we might be looking for a particular piece of text. And in this case, I'm going to look for the first space. Because for a lot of people, that's going to separate their first name from their last name. And the function I use for that is called find. You simply need to tell it what it is you're trying to find. And I have quotation marks with a space that I put in between them. It says, find the first space in this cell and return its location, which is a number. And it's five because we have Ruth is one, two, three, four letters, and the space is the fifth thing in that particular cell. Next, we want to select the text up to the first blank, that is, get her first name. And the way we're going to do that is with the function left. Left says, start at the left in this cell and go how far? I'm saying five characters. And the reason I know five is because that's what we got when we were looking for the first blank here. And when we do that, we get her first name, Ruth. Now, to get her last name, I'm going to say, get everything else. Now, because 14, which is the total length, minus 5, which is where the first space is, 14 minus 5 is 9, I'm going to simply do that. This one, however, is going to be starting from the right. And so I use the function right. It says go to the end of this cell and then count back to the left nine spaces. That gets us to the S in St. Dennis. And there's her first name. Also, a lot of times when you get information in your spreadsheet, it might be a little weird. You might have spaces where they shouldn't be. I have spaces before the name, after the name, and you often want to clean those things up so things work a little better. So, for instance, I have Ruth St. Dennis here, and you may not be able to tell, but there are three spaces before her name, and there are also three spaces after her name. So, we're going to get rid of those by using a function developed specifically for this called trim. And it gets rid of all of the leading and trailing spaces. And so now we have Ruth St. Dennis without the stuff before or after. Now, you may have guessed that it's possible to combine all of these in a logical algebra for processing text. So, for instance, maybe you have people entering their names all in one cell when they're filling out a form on your web page. So here I have Ruth St. Dennis. I want to split it into her first name and last name because that's how I want to store it in my database. I can combine these functions, and this is going to be a little complicated, but here's how it works. I get Ruth, but the way I got it 
was by first saying go to cell B9, that's where the name is, go to the left, and then find the first space in that cell, and then trim everything that comes after it. And when I do that, I get Ruth. If I want just her last name, I can use the complement of that. And in this case, it looks like this. We're going to do a combination of get the right, which is how I got the last name, but we have to do the length of the whole cell minus the space up to the first space, and then we trim the extra stuff at the end. And so, yeah, there's a lot of parentheses here, and it's a little complicated, which is why I actually do use this formula. I have a database with names in it, and I do this to rearrange the way they come in natively so that they make more sense to me. And so I have to use all this stuff, but I, I tell you, it takes me a few minutes to get it all worked out, but then I just copy it, drag it down, and it takes care of everything in the spreadsheet. It's really nice. On the other hand, what if things come last name, comma, first name? Well, then you simply do a little bit of rearranging. In this case, you're going to do the trimming. You're simply switching what we had here to over here. That's quick and easy. You're searching for the comma in this case, and you're getting the stuff that it comes after the comma, but trimming the spaces. And then the last one is for the last name, you do have to make one small modification here. And that is you have to tell it, we're going to find the comma, we're going to get the left part, but you need to include this minus one to adjust the selection because you're doing from the comma, and then you trim the blank spaces, and then you have what you need. And so all of these are different functions. In fact, let me turn on the variable view, the function view. And now you can see what's going on as a way of cleaning up, organizing, getting the information you need, so you can stick it in your own customer database and get it set up so you can then process it using other functions that can combine text and numbers and whatever else you need to suit your purposes. One of the neat tricks you can do in a spreadsheet like Google Sheets is you can use formulas not only to look at numbers or even to select text, but to start combining text with calculations, which is sort of like doing a form fill on a letter, but it gives you a lot more control and flexibility. I want to show you a few different ways of combining information. They all accomplish the same thing, but they give you different approaches to it. And depending on how many items you're using, you might want to choose one or the other. I use all of these in my own work. Let's go back to this fictional example of, say, for instance, a yoga studio. And you've got seven days here, and you're keeping track of attendance in the group yoga classes. So you got 31 on Monday, 26 on Tuesday, things drop off by Thursday, you're down to seven, then people feel bad and they start showing up. They're on the weekend. And so you have 134 people total showing up in those seven days. But let's find out how you can use some special functions in Google Sheets to combine that into a report. So I'm going to come over here for a moment. And I'm going to paste in a little bit of information. First, let's put in the beginning of a sentence. You had a total of, and then we're going to put a formula here. Now, this formula is simply referring to this data over here. It's just the sum. It's the same formula that's down here. Okay, so we've got that. But now let's put the second part of a sentence. I'm going to turn off the formula display here for a moment. You had a total of 134 visitors this week. And so what this is, is some text, a number that's derived from a formula, and then a little more text. We want to put them all together into a single sentence. Now we've got a few ways to do this. The first one is with this. Now here's, you see there's a problem with this one, by the way. What I've done is I've simply said use this cell and this cell and this cell. So you use the and sign, the ampersand, to get from one to the other. That's great, except as you can tell, it doesn't put spaces in. And so you need to add the spaces manually. And the way you do that is by inserting two more parts here. You put in quotes with a space. And so it says, take this first cell 
add a space, add the second cell, add a space, add the third cell. And so that works. And that can be a useful way of combining the information and making sure it's formatted the way you want to. It looks like a proper sentence. And it's not clear to people that you're actually doing some math to make these things happen. Another way to do it is to actually include the formula in there itself because in this one I'm using the sum that comes from up here. This one I'm including a formula that refers back to the original column. So there may be times when you want to do the calculations in your sentence or you simply want to refer to the calculations that are done elsewhere. Obviously the result is identical. Another option is to use the sentences right there in the cell itself. So let me highlight this one. This time I'm typing, you had a total of, and I'm including the space in there. Then I put the ampersand, then I put the formula sum, and then ampersand the and sign, and then quote, and I include the space here, and then visitors this week. And so the only thing that's going on here is I'm inserting that sum that makes it possible to get the rest of the information. And then there are two other ways that we can do this. There's a special function called join. And when you use join, what it does is it lets you specify the cells you want to put together and the thing you want to stick in between each cell. In this case, I'm putting quotes with a space and then comma and, and say join this one and this one and this one. I could also use D2 colon F2 to specify the range. But it's a really quick and easy way. Sometimes when you have a lot of things to put together, the join statement is going to be easier. Although I find the and statement where you're using the and sign can be a little clearer about what's going on. And then finally, one other option is to use join, but to this time have the formula for the sum right in here. So it's a self-contained statement. So it's referring to this one, join it with that, joining with that. Anyhow, you can use ampersands, the and sign, as long as you remember to put a space in by putting quote, space, quote, or you can use join. Either one allows you to combine text along with calculations based on the information. I use this a lot in spreadsheets as a way of creating a sort of mail merge. I use it to create the subject lines for emails, to have boilerplate text for emails. And so I just have to copy one, paste it into the subject, copy a second, paste it into the text, and I'm good to go. And it's based on a whole series of calculations combining text that's in my spreadsheet. So it gives you extra flexibility and extra power to work with different kinds of data to get it to best fit with your particular need. Formulas in Google Sheets can be used not only to multiply numbers or to select text or to combine things like that. They can also be used to do some basic formatting. And what's really nice about this is you can use these conditional formats, which are formula based formats to highlight data, bring your attention to, for instance, to things that are performing very well, very poorly, issues that need to be resolved. I use them frequently to help me find open cases. And let me just show you quickly how this works. Start by selecting the text that you want to format. So for instance, I'm going to come here to teacher. Now, this is something I could do easily on my own. But if you had a very long list, you wouldn't want to do this manually. Let's highlight a particular teacher. And so what I do is I select this text. And then I come over to format and down to conditional formatting. That's going to open up a little window here on the side. And it's going to apply to this range C3 through C9. That's the range I have selected here. And we're going to tell it, well, right now it says cell is not empty. Well, they all have stuff in them. I'm going to say instead that the text contains, and then I'm going to put the name of one of the teachers, Emmanuel. We have Kofi, Alex, and Emmanuel. And then I'm just going to leave this default. I can change the color if I want by clicking on one of these. I don't need to. I'm going to hit done. And now, if Emmanuel's name pops up as the teacher, then it automatically gets highlighted. And if I were to change one of the other cells to say Emmanuel, it would automatically inherit that. In fact, let's do that right here. Let's change this one to say 
I got to spell it correctly, Emmanuel. You see, it inherits the conditional formatting. Next is what if I want to highlight not just that person's name, but the entire row that they're in. This is actually what I use. I use a spreadsheet as a large database for assigning teachers to classes. And when a class isn't assigned, it says staff, but I want the whole row to highlight. And so I'm going to select this entire rectangle of data. So not just the teacher, but also the attendance and the dates. I'm going to get the whole bit of information. Then I'm going to come over to conditional formatting and I'm going to add a new rule. And the rule I'm going to add is a slightly funny one. You may not guess this one. I actually have to come down here to custom formula. And what I want to tell it to do is if the teacher is Emmanuel, then highlight the entire row. And it goes counterintuitively like this. I write equals and then the dollar sign C to say always look at column C and then 13 is there because that's the first row in the block and then if that cell is equal to Emmanuel and because it's text I have to put it in quotes then highlight it and so that's what we've got right here I hit done and you see how it's highlighted and again if we were to change another name to Emmanuel you see how the entire row inherits that highlighting. And again, this is really useful for identifying important clients. It's for identifying unassigned cases. It's uh, useful for identifying any number of situations that you can describe with a formula. And then finally, another good one is what's called a color scale. I'm going to come over here where I have the information again. I'm going to select just the attendance information. And I'm going to select a new rule here. Now, not a single color, which is what I've been doing so far, but a color scale. And what this does is it lets me choose a range of colors that go from the minimum value through the midpoint up to the maximum. Now, I don't want the green to be the low one. I'm going to switch it the other way around. I've got some choices here. I'm going to pick this one. So it goes from white to green. And it highlights the higher values. I'm going to hit done. And what you can see now is that the darkest green is on the day that we had 31 people. The white is for the lowest value, which in this set is 12. And so it can give you an impression of the range of the data. And again, maybe things you need to focus on. Maybe you need to figure out what's going on the low days. Maybe you need to figure out what you can do to increase the high days. But conditional formatting in any of these situations with the color scale, with highlighting a single cell, with highlighting an entire row, is a way of using formulas, again, not just to manipulate numbers or to manipulate text, but to manipulate the highlighting and drawing attention through additional visual cues. And it makes it a lot easier to work with your data and find the things that you need to make sense. Congratulations, you've made it to the final video in Google Sheets. And you may be wondering what to do next. Well, I'm here to discuss a couple of possible next steps for you in learning to work with data and in learning to work with Google Sheets. The most important thing is to do it yourself. Get started and get mixed in with things. You want to get some data and you just want to try, see how things work in Google Sheets. You can do a little bit experimenting, a little feeling around, see how it behaves and what you can get out of it to serve your own purposes. Now, what you're going to need to do is get some data. Now, chances are you already have some data where you work. You may have, if you're in an organization that does email marketing, you'll have the names and the email addresses and the location information, maybe information about open rates and click throughs on your email uh, newsletters. That's a great place to get data. You can download that from your email service provider. You may have social media data, things like who's following you, who's commenting, where they are, when they last interacted, what they said, and how they connected and how they shared things and what they really believed about all of it. This is information that is also available to you through the analytics of your social media host. Like if you're using Buffer or Hootsuite, you can get this information and start putting it into Google Sheets and see what you can do. Also, you may have sales data or some other kind of interaction. 
You might know what kind of items people are buying or what services they're requesting, whether a first time or a repeat customer, and also the path to purchase. Did they click on a thing in Instagram and get to Facebook and get to your web page? And that is a lot of information that can be very helpful for businesses and for service organizations to start better understanding how people are interacting with them and how they can reach out. If you have that data available to you, download it, see what you can do with it in Google Sheets beyond what you can do with the built in analytics of each of these programs. Also, you can get free data. For instance, data.gov is one of the best sources of open data in the United States. You can search for a lot of other different sources. Here I'm showing I went to data.gov and I typed in the word art. I'm looking for data sets on art. I have over 11,000 data sets found. And you know, you just click on this little CSV, which stands for comma separated values. That'll download a spreadsheet that you can open up in Google Sheets and you can get started with open data. You can also get data from Google Trends. And that's a service from Google that lets you see over time the relative popularity of different search terms. Here I've got two German operas, Deflator Mouse and De Rosenkavalier. And you can see that, for instance, the second one was more popular back in May of 2017, but the first one's been more popular since then. You can download that data by clicking on this button right here and start seeing what you can do with it in your own analysis. Finally, there's Google Correlate, one of my favorite services that lets you look at the popular search terms over time, like we had with Google Trends, but it also lets you look at state by state comparisons, where it gives you a number in terms of the actually it's standard deviations of each state in terms of the relative popularity of a search term within that state. One of my favorite ones here is the search for modern dance. And you can get that information, you can download it right here by clicking on CSV. And just in case you're wondering, the state that is head and shoulders above every other in the entire United States in terms of searches for modern dance is right here in Utah where I live. It's one of the more shocking things in terms of data driven insights. Now, there's other things that you can learn. And I suggest that if you start here with Google Sheets, you might want to try to learn some more things. So for instance, here at Data Lab CC, available either right now or in the near future, are courses on data principles. I've been showing you the tools, and I've been showing you how to work the tools, but the concepts, what does it mean to do a regression? What does it mean to have a standard deviation? I'm going to talk about those things in these other courses. I also have sets of courses on the other applications within the Google Drive Office Suite. So that's things like Google Docs for preparing reports, and Google Slides for making presentations, Google Forms for gathering new data through online surveys. And of course, there's the Microsoft Office complement of all of those, Excel and PowerPoint and Word. In addition to those, if you decide that you need more than a spreadsheet can do easily for you, you might want to try statistical software. I suggest Jamovi, a new and not very well known, but immensely wonderful application that you can download, upload your CSV and start doing high quality statistical analyses. It's free, it's open source, it's based on R, but it operates with drop down menus that make analysis very easy. Also, SPSS is a common choice in a lot of different fields, in nursing, in education, in the social sciences. We have courses on SPSS, and if that's the one that's most common in your field, try to get your data into that and see what kind of statistical modeling you can do there as well. And then, of course, if you want to go beyond that, you could try statistical programming in languages like R and Python. We have our first course in R currently available. Python will soon follow. And in any of these, you're going to be able to build on what you've done in Google Sheets, the, the insight that you've gone, and you'll be able to build on it to get more statistical modeling, more predictive analytics, more ways of finding what you need. And so it's time to get moving, get some data, get going. I'm so grateful that you joined us here at datalab.cc. I hope this has been an eye opening experience and an opportunity for you to get working with your data to find ways that you can run your organization, your business and your own personal projects more effectively and more efficiently. Thanks for joining me and good luck.